you all this work. Okay, I just want to double check that it's working, then I can turn this uh, part off. Okay, great. So that seems to be working. Um, so uh, what I wanted to go over with you guys is all the administrative things that should only take about 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then after that, we're off to uh, class, all right? So uh, this is a course, it's, as I said, a joint initiative between NUS and uh, US uh, TC, University of Science and Technology in China. And uh, since uh, we have been hosting this type of course for a while, there's a little bit more exposure for NUS students. So actually, it's uh, uh, advertised as 6101, which is a lab rotation course for NUS PhD students. Um, so typically, first year PhD students may or may not be attached to an advisor yet. So we have them do lab rotations to uh, select uh, what area of research and per um, perhaps which faculty member they want to do research with. So uh, our uh, lab group is actually quite full, but we offer this uh, lab rotation to help people get a better understanding of natural language processing and other um, uh, related work uh, that um, our, our group cares about. Okay, so um, 6101, uh, as this lab rotation is called, so this is uh, 6101 is basically a half semester course. So it's about a seven week course. There are two back-to-back -back versions of it. So uh, one is from week three, which is next week to week seven, which is after the midterm break. And there's another session between week eight to week 13. Um, we start this course early just because uh, we usually uh, try to align it to our semester schedule instead of just the PhD student schedules. So those of you in 6101 will actually be only participating half the course, but we definitely welcome you to uh, be a part of this course for the entire semester um, uh, because it is uh, actually one course throughout the entire semester. The second, uh, the people taking 6101 in the second half will actually have to deal with uh, picking up the prerequisites that we cover in the first half. Um, we also have 10 very brave and um, enterprising uh, undergraduates, okay, uh, some of them maybe even year one. Mostly we see uh, year two and year three undergraduate students uh, doing a, an exploratory module for four modular credits or a regular uh, course module. Uh, this is done in the do-it-yourself module uh, uh, method, so meaning that uh, the students in this course basically uh, work with a faculty member to learn an area of research by themselves, okay? So um, for these students, because it counts as a regular course, we're expecting you to do 10 hours of work a week for the entire course, or 140 hours in total. So um, that's uh, quite unlike everyone else uh, in, in the cohort. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what the expectations are there, okay? Um, Primarily, this course is actually a reading group. So my team at NUS does natural language uh, processing research, among other things. And uh, we have a, a one, one to actually have a regular reading session for our students to get uh, good background knowledge and participate in uh, discussing information, which is primarily why we started this, but we found it uh, useful to involve other people as well. Okay, so um, uh, my team has a bit more experience in this area. Uh, certain students in my group have more experience than I do, and that's great, and we can all benefit from working together. Okay, and last but not least at all, we found it very useful to make the course open to the public. Now, um, I make this disclaimer every uh, semester, which is that if this was a real course where I'm really giving lectures like our undergraduate courses, I wouldn't be able to make this course accessible to external participants, right? Then, uh, you know, you don't need to pay tuition fees. You can just come on to Zoom and, and then take the course. So this is a bit different because this course, I'm not going to be doing much of the lecturing. This is where my research group is doing the organizational scaffolding to help other people, uh, all of us in, in this course, learn together, okay? So that's why we're offering it this way. Okay, with that in mind, uh, let's talk about what we expect from all of you. 
Okay. So the PhD students in my lab group, um, as well as everyone else, so this is wrong, but I should put this away. Okay. Is uh, basically responsible for giving one of the lectures. Okay. In part, okay, we don't expect you to give the entire lecture. There's just too many people to do that, okay? And also to offer support during one lecture, okay? So I'll, I'll explain what we mean by that um, in a short while, okay? Those people who are attending as external guests, uh, which are not part of NUS, which are uh, uh, possibly from um, uh, University of Science and Technology in China, um, we hope that you will do the same. Uh, but you will also need to uh, do the group project. So um, everyone has a lecturing uh, opportunity. Everyone has to support the lecturers. And uh, we also all need to do a group project, okay? The project can be also individual as well. So we anticipate your project should take about 60 hours in total over the next 13, uh, 12 to 13 weeks or so. So uh, you can spend a couple hours each week on that. Um, to, to work on the project and also uh, spend a little bit of time coordinating among multiple team members, okay? For our DYC 1401 students, those are all of the people doing it as an undergraduate in NUS. Uh, because this is an advanced module, you're uh, working alongside uh, PhD students. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, technical detail that you'll need to master on your own. Uh, we plan to help you with that, but for the most part, that's self-preparatory work. And uh, you can use Slack uh, to talk with other people to try to understand some of the basics. So um, when we present papers this week and uh, the following weeks, it may be a little bit tough going uh, at the beginning. And that's okay. You should expect uh, to be overwhelmed by uh, the concepts at the beginning. But then hopefully by the middle of the course, you're much more comfortable. Okay. Um, because the course is structured in a way that's uh, top uh, or front loaded rather, uh, the difficult part is in front. You can use the extra time uh, where in your other courses in NUS, you haven't been taught a lot, you can spend the balance of that time uh, where you're more free during the beginning of the semester, learning the concepts of um, some basic materials that you'll need for this course, okay? So that self-preparatory work is really, really crucial for do-it-yourself students because um, there's a lot that you'll need to uh, understand on your own, okay? Um, and you can ask us uh, about the, anything on that area. Okay, um, so those are what you'll need to do. Let me go over the webpage for a second about what that means. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the page. Okay. So uh, as you know, this semester, we're going to be focusing on conversational systems, recommender systems, and uh, their intersections, okay? And as it says here, there'll be seven reading sessions. And then on the alternate Thursday, so next Thursday, uh, from the same timing of 1 to 3 p.m., we will have project consultations. So I'll talk about project consultations in a second, okay? So the schedule is as follows. We uh, each uh, alternate week, we will have a lecture. The lecture will be given by all of us, okay? So um, we will take turns uh, giving the lecture material. So the first two sessions will be on conversational systems, also known as dialogue systems, okay? The following two weeks, week six and week seven in the NUS calendar, which is actually there's a recess week intervening, okay? These two will be on uh, recommendation systems, okay? And then uh, weeks uh, 9, uh, 11, and 13 will be on conversational recommendation system. So, uh, of course, because it's an intersection, you will need to know a little bit uh, about uh, uh, dialogue systems or conversational systems as well as recommendation systems in order to make the second half of the course more meaningful to you. Okay? And as I said, we'll be all participating in this. So that means uh, we will have to pick one of the, um, each one of us will have to pick uh, a couple of these sessions, give a preference, okay, on, on which things you're interested in. And then I will help arbitrate and assign you to a particular week in which you will be in charge of actually giving the lecture 
for um, you know no more than ten minutes. Okay, so it means, for example, reading one paper, trying hard to understand it, presenting it. Um, in certain cases, if you don't understand the material, it's okay. We present it. This is a reading group. It's not meant to be a lecture. That means if you don't understand, it's perfectly fine to disclaim that you understand. You can say, well, I'm not really sure what this equation means. Um, I saw the figure. I have some intuitive idea of what it means, but can someone help me walk me through the math? Okay. And then we'll discuss this together because uh, many times a presenter um, if you were a lecturer in school, you would have to know what you're talking about, but because this is a really a reading group, a study group, we don't um, necessarily want that. We want there to be more dialogue and discussion, okay? So hopefully uh, we will see this type of pattern borne out, okay? And uh, where do you express that information? You put it here, okay? So um, this worksheet, uh, you can find at this address, uh, bit.ly 6101. Uh, dash lecture choice. And so um, what I'll need you to do is uh, before the end of today, uh, I'll need you to visit this worksheet. So the, the address is right here. I'm gonna copy that and put it on Slack too. Okay, so that you can see it. Uh, let me put this one away. Okay, so um, here is the worksheet. Okay, so please access that link. You will need to write your name down, okay? Um, your Slack ID, if you're an NUS student, please provide your student ID, okay? Your email address, okay? Um, you can ignore G for right now, okay? And then what I'll need you to do is scroll to column I and J, okay? And you'll see that uh, I says, which week you're interested in the lecture role. So you have to pick one of these three topics, either conversational systems, dialogue systems, or conversational dialogue systems. They correspond to certain weeks, okay? Like uh, um, the uh, dialogue system is week two, which is this week, as well as week four. Okay, so if you wanted to do something related to that, you would put that in the cell uh, for yourself. So uh, for example, here, that's my name. I would just put, okay, well, I'm interested in presenting next week, so I'll put down week four, okay? But you can uh, uh, put a, a couple of preferences, okay? And um, the same for the support role. I'll cover the support role in a couple of minutes time, what that means, okay? And then what happens is we actually need to make sure there's enough coverage of the materials uh, so that we have, uh, um, you know, adequate number of lecturers who are, who are interested in giving the material and uh, adequate number of support staff who are interested in questioning or scribing, okay? So um, you know, we can put our preferences here. What I will do is then uh, use those preferences and assign you into the weeks that you're presenting. So uh, at the end of the uh, time, I will uh, assign you to a particular week in column L for the time that you're going to be lecturing. Okay, again, not for the whole time, maybe at most 10, 10 to 15 minutes. And then uh, for column N, which week you are delegated as support, okay? I will do that on a separate worksheet over here, which uh, just lets me know which, which uh, number of people we have for each role, okay? So we want to try to balance it uh, to become a uniform distribution so that we have sufficient numbers of people working together. Okay, now with the lecturer role, what will happen is that in Slack, uh, you will see that there are a number of preparatory channels. So week two, actually uh, a lot of people from my group have been in charge of week two because this is our first week of class. So we have been uh, getting ready the materials, okay? If you are assigned to week four, week six, week seven, week nine, week 11, and week 14, you will use these channels to negotiate who is doing which parts of the lecture. So typically what we see is, you know, there might be um, somewhere between three to five papers that uh, people want to cover. Um, we delegate uh, one paper to one to three different people to discuss. Sometimes it's easier not to do it in the presentation style, but have it more of a discussion. So uh, uh, especially if we're not very well prepared, like 
Um, this morning, I, I have to present one of the papers, but I've only read it briefly. So I'm gonna actually make it a discussion rather than a presentation, okay? So uh, discussions are, I think, uh, much more favored than presentations because uh, we retain material when we have to interact with it, okay? So we'll actually be reading uh, some of these papers together um, on during the session itself, okay? So uh, uh, what we'll do in these channels is basically prepare what we uh, want to present. So the team who is lecturing was going to compile all the slides. All the slides will be put into a single Google document uh, presentation. And then we will share uh, the, the, the team that's responsible for the preparation will share uh, that uh, link on the general channel. So you can see here, I've put the slide link uh, for this week. Um, it has a short link already manufactured for it. And then um, you know we'll share that out so that everyone uh, can uh, look at the slides, okay? All right, so uh, you won't be actually able to edit these columns. These are locked so that I will have to do that. But uh, once I decide uh, who is presenting at which time, you can uh, be uh, joining the appropriate channel uh, so that you can begin to introduce yourself and then make arrangements for which paper or which sections of the papers you want to discuss, okay? Okay, so um, if you have questions about the workflow, hopefully all of you are on the uh, Slack workspace that I'm looking at now. Uh, you can go ahead and, and type a question there or put it into uh, the Zoom chat, either way would be fine, okay? So um, using this system, we'll hopefully get a, a better understanding of uh, what questions you have. Okay, so I wanna cover a little bit more from our administrative work, okay? Um, so I've already told you about the lecturing. Uh, there's also a support role, okay? So the support role works uh, a little differently. So if you go to the pinned uh, discussions, uh, there's the reading group uh, house rules, which I think everyone has read, okay? So um, what we're going to be doing is uh, basically scribing and commenting on um, the presentation, okay? So there's actually uh, a directory, okay, which I'm gonna share with you now. Uh, I think we can just share it from here, okay? Okay, so now you have that. It's a directory where we're going to keep all of our artifacts that we manufacture for this class. So you can see already there's the slides for today about uh, Minus Trivia, and then there's the slide deck that I just shared with you. And there's also a scribing notes, okay? So each time we have a, a session, a lecture session, you guys, uh, and, uh, if you're assigned a support staff role, you will be asked to look through this document add material to it. So as papers are presented, uh, as questions come up, uh, you should scribe them down. Okay, so uh, you could, let's say, for example, start already here, okay, min, admin this trivia, okay, and then uh, put links to the deck and then say, uh, what, what did uh, I say, okay? So the whole point is to free up the lecturing staff from uh, taking notes. So that's why we have a dedicated uh, role uh, that students and guests have to play for doing that, okay? So uh, just to make it clear, um, for this week, we don't have anyone assigned to the support staff. That means all of us are actually gonna do the support staff role for today. So um, uh, as you are uh, listening to the presentations, feel free to use the, the, this uh, conversational systems lecture notes um, this is gonna be shared between this week as well as two weeks from now in week four to take notes about uh, what, what you've seen. So you can um, take screenshots, you can uh, link in articles. For example, most of the computer science research these days is uh, pre-printed on the archive. So you can paste in archive links, uh, you can write questions down, anything that helps us to extend the conversation, okay? So the conversation comes uh, in a uh, sort of a slightly more codified archival form in this document, uh, but we can also use the Slack group for um, messages that we can talk about now, okay? So those are all going to be important artifacts. 
So the reason why we do this is uh, basically, uh, you know, we are really lucky to have so many scientists give their research for free through archive, through the ACL anthology, through other preprints. Okay. And what we want to do is give back, right? So you, you also see a lot of medium posts, a lot of blog posts or popularized press uh, articles and our, our place is somewhere in between, okay? We want to uh, have a reading group that helps people digest the primary science, but also make it a little bit easier for other people coming after us to self-study the materials, okay? So that's, that's the point of uh, creating the lecture notes that you're looking at now and some of you are contributing, okay? But also to uh, create the, um, you know, the YouTube videos in case anyone wants to watch our lectures, okay? Uh, it's not usually gonna be watched, but uh, once in a while we have people that pick up a little snippet or two uh, of work from the reading group and it helps them understand. So it's uh, our way of giving back to the community, both in terms of a video. Uh, so again, uh, when you give your presentation, if you don't mind, please turn on your video. If you, uh, for privacy reasons, you don't want to um, have your video shown, that's perfectly fine as well. Okay, so that, that's up to you, okay? But um, basically these are the two forms that we try to give back to the community um, who is giving us the primary research pretty much for free, right? It's uh, pre-printed or available through the ACM or the ACL anthologies, okay? So uh, please continue to go ahead and, and write your notes. Uh, please help each other out with that uh, rather than just listen because uh, listening is a passive activity but when you engage and you note take uh, as medical professionals will tell you they had described when they were in medical school, it helps you retain the information much better. Okay. So uh, that's what I mean. Support just means, again, trying to complement the lecturing staff. Sometimes it means being uh, a little bit familiar with the topic at hand. So when you know which papers are going to be presented, you may actually want to read them because you're not responsible for lecturing, you might just know, okay, I have a question here. Maybe I can bring that up during the lecture itself, okay? And uh, just like most other uh, things, it's much more interesting. We get multiple people um, in our, our, our uh, Zoom session active. So if you have a question or um, anything, please just jump in and ask. Uh, don't be afraid to grab the mic or use the chat so that uh, uh, in either Zoom or Slack, so that we can get information, okay? Support also means that you can uh, insert links into the Slack channel too, okay? Um, so board staff usually go through the session, uh, the YouTube session afterwards, then they go through the Slack messages from that week, and they try to compile it into a, a digestible form for um, uh, posterity uh, by compiling it into our Google Doc notes, okay? So um, that's what I mean by doing current, and post discussion support on the topic. Okay, so uh, the lecturing role. Some of you uh, may have not lectured before. Some of you may be intimidated by the idea of uh, being recorded, um, intimidated by the idea of lecturing in a second language. I assure you it's uh, going to might be much easier with practice, okay? So one of the things that we see both for undergraduate as well as PhD students is without presentation skills, uh, your writing skills and uh, reporting skills get weaker. Okay, so this is a, a chance to practice. It's generally not for a grade, it's just for you to get comfortable with presenting research material and to give you a little bit more impetus uh, in studying it well, okay? Uh, but like I said, it's a discussion group and it's not a lecture. So it's perfectly fine if you don't know what uh, you're, you're actually saying or, or um, um, you're not clear of the math or, or why certain things are. Then you ask, right? You ask during your uh, lecturing time, okay? So what we want to do is because this uh, group is happening every Friday, okay, for lecture, okay? That means by the Tuesday of that week, so uh, earlier this week on Tuesday, we need to decide on the papers that are going to be presented, okay? The lecturing role um, is given to a number of people. So all of you have same responsibility, but it's good to self-organize and try to assign one person to lead the coordination overall. Say, okay, I think the structure should be this paper first, 
and that paper, et cetera, then split the duties by paper. That's uh, what we've seen is most effective, okay? Hopefully, uh, we want uh, your lectures to be pretty short, okay? We don't really care so much about the math um, in the lecturing component, okay? That's very important when you do the project component. Uh, and there's so uh, not really much need to discuss actual results, okay? Because as uh, I'll emphasize during uh, the reading group, most of the papers are very formal. They say that they're better than the current state of the art. And that sort of stands to the reason because it's published work, okay? So those pieces of information are rarely very important to us. What's really interesting is when they have discussed why their system is so good. So uh, having a discussion section is the part that we really want to present because those discussion sessions help us understand the limitations or ad advantages of their work over previous work, okay? So when you're lecturing, try to use the mouse for support like I'm doing because sometimes when you wave this tiny cursor around in Zoom or in YouTube videos, it's impossible to see. So uh, try, try to highlight what you're talking about or annotate it if you have an iPad or uh, some other uh, uh, touch screen where you can annotate your slides uh, while you're lecturing, that gives a much more dynamic uh, view. Okay, so um, yeah, I think uh, we generally want to uh, finalize the scribe document the following week. So today is week two, the end of week two. That means by this time next week, we should have the scribe document for uh, the version of this document just for week two finished up. Okay, that's the idea that we want to have, okay? Now, uh, as I said, the timeline is that we have the reading group on Fridays, okay? Uh, we will try to edit the YouTube video uh, done properly and clipped and annotated by Monday the following week. And by Friday, as it said uh, earlier, we need to make sure uh, the scribes finish the consolidation of the notes and uh, we need to uh, embed the video and put the paper list that was finally decided into the website. That is also done by the scribe team by doing a pull request against the GitHub repo. So uh, as you already saw here, this is the website, but it is just a Jekyll page, uh, which is connected to a, uh, um, a GitHub repository. So uh, we just need to edit the data here in pages in order to get this fixed up, okay? All right, um, the other really important part of this course, aside from the lecturing and support, is the uh, projects, okay? So we find that students uh, actually get a lot more out of understanding papers when they have to implement them or use them in the project, okay? So uh, we want you to do that. It is a very large part of the deliverables for course students. Um, and uh, although we don't have any rights to demand this of external guests, we would like you to also participate, okay? Um, otherwise, it's not really that useful to have you in, in the reading group, okay? You could just watch the, the cast on YouTube later if you wanted to. So by committing to uh, attend the reading group as external guest, we also want you to do a project, okay? Um, and the way the projects work is that we can take an un, uh, un, a not a, a specified number of team members. So uh, ideally, it will be somewhere between uh, one to six different people, okay? Uh, and uh, these people will work together in a project group. Uh, you can find project members by advertising on the projects channel in Slack. Okay, so if you go back to Slack, we have a projects channel here. Okay, so then uh, you can uh, uh, join this channel and then introduce yourself and say, okay, well, I'm interested in conversational systems or I'm interested in recommendation systems. I want to build an application for this domain or I want to work with this type of data. And then we'll try to make sure that we're all arranged into project groups, okay? So when you uh, do this, it means that let's say you use the project group channel to fi find the participants that are interesting to you, okay? Then you go back to the worksheet uh, that we showed you earlier, this uh, Google sheet. And then uh, you will need to start to fill in a project title. 
So at the beginning, I'll just say like pro project uh, zero one or whatever, okay? And then uh, everyone who's uh, on the same project will use the same project title. You guys can come back to this worksheet and change your project title later to be reflective of your current understanding about what you're doing, okay? So if you already know your project members, you can go ahead and select a unique string and then put it in column G, okay? So that all, all of you interested in working together can do that, okay? Now, uh, projects uh, are going to be uh, very more useful to you if you want to ally yourself to people who you don't know, okay? So for example, we have students here in the first year PhD program, some undergraduates, some external grads, some people from our research group. It would be really nice to see, you know, uh, all of our uh, projects not being homogenous, not being only external guests, not being only undergraduates, okay? So you can benefit more from diversity and that's why, in part, we offered this course, right? Because we want to connect our group to external participants, uh, let external participants know what our research group is doing, et cetera, and involve pipelines uh, all the way down to undergraduates, okay? So um, this is why we want to, uh, you to form project groups that are diverse. So I'll just write that in here, project groups open. Okay, um, so because projects are so important, we are going to divert uh, alternate first days to consult with project teams. We haven't quite finalized that yet, but what this means is that uh, we will be holding a Zoom breakout, a uh, Zoom session just like today, but on Thursday from one to three, and we will uh, create breakout rooms, okay? And each breakout room, there will be a project team presenting their notions of what they're going to do or what they're interested in. And then uh, staff from our uh, group, as well as other project teams that are not presenting yet, uh, are going to be assigned to talk with other people, okay? Uh, so that we can get a, a conversation going so that all teams know which other uh, projects are going on and we can help each other improve our own projects, okay? So to do that, uh, you'll need to kickstart this by uh, having each group do a, a short presentation about who their team members are, what's the current progress this week, uh, what they find interesting, any papers that are, are useful that they found uh, useful to read, okay, and then share that with the people in the group, okay. Um, now, I know some students or uh, guests uh, cannot stay for two hours on Thursdays, they've only committed Friday afternoons, that's fine. Um, you do need to come part of Thursday at least to uh, get the check-in so that we can check on your progress on your projects, okay? So uh, we hope that you can zone some time for that. It doesn't have to be all two hours, although that's uh, definitely appreciated where you can. Okay, so uh, next week in week three, we don't have lecture, okay? We, we haven't started lecture yet, that'll be very shortly. But uh, in week three, what uh, we want you to do is uh, take this week between week two and week three, between now and Thursday, uh, to identify some team members you might want to work with. Again, you can just simply go to the project channel, okay? Uh, introduce yourself, you know, who you are, where you're from, how uh, and why you're taking this class, and perhaps a little bit about um, what, what interests you. So uh, while you saw gives the introduction to our lecture this uh, afternoon, I will go in ahead and uh, fill in a self-introduction of myself and give you a template for how to follow in the project's channel, okay? All right, so as I said, uh, the ideal team size goes from about uh, range two to six for this, okay? So if you have questions, uh, please uh, go ahead and, and tell us. Uh, uh, via chat or via um, uh, the general channel in Slack. Okay, we appreciate uh, whatever uh, feedback you have so far. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So um, I will go ahead and uh, turn the time over to our introduction, uh, which comes from Yi Song. 
So uh, Yi Song is a student in our group, uh, just recently joined, but he has actually been a master's student and an undergraduate at uh, NUS for a while. Um, so you need to go to the slide deck uh, that says uh, uh, 0204 Conversational Systems 1, okay? And if, uh, from uh, slide two onwards, uh, Yi Song can present. So I'm going to stop my screen sharing here. Uh, yeah. Just pause. Okay. And I will show my screen. Okay, I'm sharing my screen of Safari. Okay, good. Uh, so do we have questions? Okay. okay. So um, our undergraduates, if you don't understand everything uh, uh, that happens this week, don't don't uh, worry. Persevere. Uh, especially that's also true for our, our external guests. You know, if you're, you're not really sure what's going on, um, drop us a line in, in Slack and uh, we will help try. Oh, the screen. Was I share screen? We can see your screen this time. So, uh, can you guys see my screen? Right. I mean, my uh, slides that deck now already. Good? Okay. Okay. Uh, can I start now? Yeah, uh, please go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, thanks, Prof Ming, for his uh, course logistic. So I will give a very, uh, very short and very intuitive overview of the uh, of the contents we are going to cover in in the following weeks, uh, in week two and week four. Okay, let's proceed. Uh, so we are talking about dialogue system. So uh, in the research society today, dialogue system can be uh, uh, roughly divided into two categories. Uh, the first category is the task-oriented dialogue system. And the second one is non-task-oriented dialogue system. So how about we start from the first one, the task-oriented dialogue system. So as for a task-oriented dialogue system, uh, by its name, we know that uh, this system or agents uh, it is to help a human to fulfill a specific goal, right? So here I, I attach my own screenshot from my own la laptop. I have uh, touched the Siri button and the Siri has prompted me with this uh, a chat box. And in this box, Siri told me that I can interact with her in following ways. Uh, I can ask uh, to find her, to show my uh, downloads folder, to ask the system preference to make the screen brighter. And I can also even ask how fast is my Mac? So here's the ways that I can uh, in uh, interact with Siri. So in this slide, I have done some case study. Here is one successful case about Siri. Uh, I have asked Siri to help me send a text message to, to Professor Min. And in this turn, it's very successful and Siri has uh, created a new chat box between me between me and Professor Min. And Siri also asked, uh, what do you want to say? And I said, as I want to say, do you want some coffee? And Siri also successfully filled in the blank that saying they want some coffee and asked ready to send it. Well, sorry, I didn't send it and I didn't buy any coffee. <laughs> okay, so it's a su successful case. However, I also find that there are many unsuccessful cases for Siri. So on the left-hand side, here's a, a conversation between me and Siri. I ask, how fast is my Mac? And Siri only replied that your Mac has a Apple M1 processor. So, okay, boys, we, we all know that M1 is good, but for me, I want more uh, specs rather than a simple uh, description that I have an M1 processor. So this one is not quite successful. And on the, on the right-hand side is a multi-run or multi-turn dialogue. And I use this example to show, uh, show to you guys that Siri really has limited uh, ability to handle this multi-run conversation scenario. So let's follow me to look at the first turn. I asked Siri, hey Siri, when will be the CNY Chinese New Year? And Siri is uh, good at answering this question by replying that, uh, uh, Chinese New Year is on Friday, uh, 12 February. However, on the second turn, I ask, uh, do I have any appointments at that day? So in this turn, Siri gave a not quite good uh, response by replying the appointments that are going to happen today instead of 
the Chinese New Year Day. So it means that Sarah is not able to understand that day as 12 February. It implies that Siri has, uh, Siri do not know the coreference between dialogues. Coreference is the NLP phenomenon, uh, telling that the two objects are co-referring to each other, uh, which implies that Siri has quite limited ability on multi-round conversation. Okay, so let's start with Siri. From Apple, let's move to Microsoft, right? So Microsoft, Xiao Ai's chatbot, Xiao Bing, Xiao Ai's. So Xiao Ai's chatbot belongs to an, the second category, which is non-task oriented dialogue system. So this line of work or research can also be referred to as like chit chat system or chatbots. Uh, people interact or chat with them um, mainly for entertaining purpose, not necessarily that uh, a specific goal should be accomplished. So here and on the right hand side, we can see a conversation between a WeChat user with the Xiao Ice embedded in WeChat. So uh, Xiao Ice is quite intelligent. It could give a reasonable response to multi metal information like here's the image and so, so I could, uh, could could respond with a reasonable text to the image. Here's the plain text and also reasonable uh, uh, responses. So here the non-task oriented dialogue system is also quite related to the Turing test. So I think many guys should have known the Turing test, right? So uh, briefly put, Turing test is sort of the ultimate goal for AI development. It means that when a when an evaluator to uh, to have a con conversation with a com computer or a machine, it has no idea whether it's a computer or a human. It means that the conversation brought by the machine is quite fluent, quite knowledgeable, and quite I mean, quite intelligent to imitate a human. So here we have a bonus. The bonus that what is the first chatbot or chit chat system to pass Turing test? You guys, do you know that? What is the first system to pass Turing test? You guys can feel free to unmute and answer. <laughs> I always like 10 seconds. Do you guys know what is the first chatbot to pass Turing test? And here is a hint. The graph here, the figure here is a hint. Uh, that is sort of the name of the system. <laughs> do, do you know which chatbot has passed the train test? Okay, so 10 seconds has passed and I will show you the answer. The system is named Perry. Perry is, uh, 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 Perry is the P-A-R-R-Y. Uh, Perry is the, the, the sports that the, the, the two guys are uh, fighting with each other with a sword. It, it, it's also called uh, fencing. So the uh, Perry system was uh, introduced in 1968. Yeah, so here's a bonus. Okay, so finally it comes to the last slides of mine and I will give a short intro to the, uh, to the following, following of this lecture. So uh, in our reading group, we will focus more on the task oriented dialogue system rather than the non-task oriented ones. The reason is that uh, in recent years, the task-oriented dialogue system has been paid so much research attention. And, and I personally believe that this one is a better uh, a formulated or a better formed than the non-task-oriented one. So here, uh, this figure is excerpted from a, a very famous survey paper by Chen et al. Uh, published at, at, at uh, Kennedy uh, three years ago. So they have sort of decomposed a dialogue system in this way. So let's follow me and look at this graph here. So dialogue system, like any other computer system, is take something as inputs and process it and generate a output. So here, the, the four green components are the processor for the dialogue system. So the first one is the natural language understanding uh, components uh, because the, the, the system has to understand what the user is saying, right? So here on the right hand side is a, a dialogue state tracking and policy learning. So now our society have sort of uh, combined these two as a dialogue management system that uh, we can manage the dialogue. And finally is the natural language gener generation components that can generate the real output. 
So in this lecture, we are going to cover these three components because we have combined the, the two together. So let's join me and welcome our following speakers. So, okay, uh, thanks Yi Song for uh, yeah. giving that introduction. So uh, we can see from that final graph that we start with um, a dialogue, right? And we, we have to go through some stages. We need to go through the natural language understanding uh, part of uh, what we're discussing, uh, which will be something that I'll talk a little bit about, uh, not very much, but I'm gonna do it in a, in a dialogue rather than a presentation. Um, then uh, after that, we, we need to do the dialogue state tracking, uh, do the policy learning, and then finally generate uh, language out. So let's let's talk about uh, natural language understanding. So uh, a paper that Yi Song picked out um, that's uh, quite good, but also pretty advanced um, is the DCR net paper, uh, which is uh, uh, done by uh, students um, who are actually uh, coming to NUS to uh, be with us. Uh, so I posted it in the general channel. This is work by uh, co uh, led uh, by Li Bo Chin uh, from the Harbin Institute of Technology. Um, and uh, you can please uh, download the paper from the link that I've provided. And again, those of you uh, who would like a more interactive part, please do scribe. So uh, I do see a couple of people active on the scribe uh, document. So uh, that, that's very nice as well. Okay, so let me share my screen uh, and then uh, we'll get started. Okay, so uh, here's the paper uh, that I'm uh, showing you, right? So this is the DCR net paper. Um, and uh, I wanna give you a little bit of a meta idea about what research papers are like and what you should be reading for. Okay, but before we go into depth. So this is a, a standard uh, uh, full length paper, which is about eight pages long. And it has a sort of a very standard structure, right? So there's a, a title, usually the title has a system name somewhere in there. So you can see here um, that that's no different. You know, they, these authors have uh, put a system name called DCRNet. Okay, um, and then after that, uh, what they've done is they've gone ahead and use a, a, a rhetorical uh, method, which is to show a, a example, right? So you can see on the right-hand side there, there's an example of the type of information that they're going to address, okay? So here we already get at some of what, what we mean by natural language understanding, right? So here you can see there's a speaker A and a speaker B. So two people are in a dialogue with each other. So it's dialogue because there are two. Right? And they, they've um, uh, given some words, uh, typically we call this an utterance, so it's a sentence, uh, but in dialogue systems or uh, conversational systems, we call these utterances. So user A says they are as tired of social media as I am. And then the user B responds, yes, I don't get it. Everyone I talk to about Facebook, everyone hates it, but none of them will take action. Okay, so um, these are just two turn uh, uh, two turns um, in in the dialogue. Okay, where a speaker A has gone and speaker B, and then uh, what you see on the right hand side there is uh, what we want the system to understand. So this is a natural language understanding part, right? So the idea that we have a dialogue act, okay. And uh, in certain cases, uh, a sentiment. So if we believe that uh, statements are positive or negative, then we might say they have a sentiment. Okay, so there's a dialogue act label, which is going to take uh, one of three different uh, classifications, a statement, you know, a declarative statement, uh, agreement or disagreement, uh, an opinion, right? Or a request, you know, I might be asking you a question. Okay, so these are the types of things that we want to label in a dialogue act. Okay, so that's what we mean by a DA, right? It says down at the bottom, uh, dialogue act. So um, if you can uh, think of it like that, you know, uh, we have the input uh, that we have on the left and the output of the system on the right. Okay. So uh, what these uh, this team of researchers noted is that actually these two tasks that you have on the right 
are something that uh, benefit from each other. Okay, so in the title of the paper, you also see this interesting word joint. Okay, so whenever you see this word, you should be smiling to myself. Haha, <laughs> I know what that means, right? It means that I'm doing two things together and somehow they're benefiting each other. Okay, so they tell you exactly what's interesting. They say that sometimes when I know something about the dialogue act, that helps me understand what the sentiment is, okay? And conversely, uh, if I knew the sentiment of a sentence, maybe that helps me understand what the dialogue is about, okay? So in natural language processing, you probably know there are many different tasks that we need to do. So uh, we need to segment sentences, we need to separate words, we need to assign part of speech tags, all of these different things. And they are really disjoint tasks uh, when we think about them from a very uh, engineering standpoint, a very reductional standpoint, okay? But when we think of this as a natural activity uh, that humans do, definitely we, we don't say, okay, I'm gonna part of speech tag first, and then I'm going to uh, put constituent tags around it, et cetera, and then I'm going to do semantic role labeling. All of this is sort of like done all simultaneously. So it's very much a, a joint problem that we do it as humans. Okay, um, separately, I think uh, some of you will, will uh, know that in NLP, there's a lot of tasks lately where we see a lot of progress being made when systems handle problems jointly, okay? So I'm gonna open up the floor here and ask all of you, why is joint learning better uh, than just standard classification? It's okay if you don't know, I mean, just, just try to humor me and, and uh, give me a reason. Uh, if I could guess, maybe like you could use it in because you get multiple labels. Maybe you can use it as part of a pipeline in a diff, in more steps of the learning or like to do the task. Yeah, that's basically right. Thanks, Stephen, for playing along. So, uh, you know, when we are doing multiple things, sometimes they have uh, some mutual information. They can help you with another thing, right? That happens a lot of the times, right? So if I, I'm looking for my keys, uh, maybe I'm in the act of finding things, then I could also, while I'm doing that, um, do another task, which is, uh, you know, try to locate another object uh, at the same time, okay? So um, doing two things at once, uh, sometimes they overlap in the type of outputs that they might have, okay? Uh, and so we see these days in NLP, a lot of cases where trying to classify one thing and classifying another thing uh, can, can actually help. So um, that's the case here too, where we see that uh, understanding what type of act uh, uh, an utterance is performing might actually help me understand the sentiment, okay? Now let's get more specific than that. Why do you think that dialogue acts, uh, that is to whether or not you, you know whether a particular you belongs to one of the sets of a statement, a declarative statement, um, a request for information, like a question, okay? Or, uh, you know, an agreement or a disagreement. Why would this help you uh, with sentiment? So uh, somebody else besides Steven? Um, I can go. Yeah, please go yeah, ahead. Um, so from the example given in the paper here, uh, user A has already been labeled as negative, right? So if you're agreeing to that statement, essentially the A follows that statement label would be they are negative as well, it follows. Exactly, right? So uh, is it Omar? Is that how I pronounce your name? Um, I'm Asharun. Asharun, okay. Yes. Asharun said that uh, basically if I have uh, a negative sentiment in the previous uh, utterance, and then the following statement is labeled as an agreement. Well, you have to be agreeing to something, right? You have to be agreeing to the previous statement. So whatever sentiment uh, that that has is likely to be propagated over. And that's exactly right, okay? So um, that's the case where a uh, sentiment label could help uh, 
with the DA label and then vice versa, right? If I know there's an agreement, then I can use the previous sentiment label and propagate that to the next sentiment label, okay? So it goes in both directions. So this observation was the key reason why these researchers decided that a joint dialogue act was important, okay? Everyone okay with that so far? Okay, so if you are, are stuck or not understanding anything, uh, just go to the participants list and mark a big X, a big red X, uh, so that we, we know you, you, you have some trouble understanding. But if you get it, uh, then that, that's good. Okay. All right. Um, hi, Prof, I got a question. Yes, go ahead, everything. Um, so here it mentions joint learning, right? But I also heard of something called multitask learning. Are they similar? Yeah, they're actually the same thing. Multitask means exactly that. So join can mean just between two different things. Multitask usually generally denotes uh, more than two. So that's exactly right. The idea is that the more the merrier, the more things you uh, do, the better you might get. Okay, so um, if, if there's anyone on the call for, uh, from our group who would like to um, uh, talk more about that, uh, for example, Abhinav or Liangming, uh, you're welcome to, to speak up. Uh, maybe I can jump in and say something, because I think I've read something about on a paper uh, about this person who created this thing called the Deca Net. So basically, he's trying to do something like what was described earlier of multitask learning, and he was trying to show how is it that his single system can outbeat 10 different systems who are built for specific tasks. Yeah. I think it's the, the not that connect that capital, I think, um, NLP. So, yeah, that call NLP. So, this is the, the project that I, I think Clarence was saying. Um, so, this is actually a, uh, a task that's uh, created uh, by Salesforce Research. Okay. So, um, they're the ones who, who started this uh, system. Uh, so, there's a very well known researcher. His name is Richard Socher. He uh, previously was at Salesforce uh, and, and uh, um, was one of the people who uh, created this task. So this task is the, exactly like uh, what Clarence said. It's an amalgam of many different tasks put together. Uh, you can see the whole list here. And that basically they said, if, you're, if you do all of these tasks together, somehow your system will get pretty good. It will get robust and uh, it can outperform a system that's specifically trained to do one of them, okay? So um, it's basically saying being a generalist is good. Being a jack of all trades is better than being a master of one, okay? So um, that, that's what we can draw out of that. Okay, so thanks for that contribution. Anyone else would like to contribute a little bit here? Please do, I mean, it's the discussion group. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, for this kind of joint learning, I mean, is it harder to maybe jumping the gun, it's harder to train this kind of models or is it uh, easier? Because you have 10 different functions in your know, operating function is going to cause some problems, I think. I, mean, I just don't know. Is it true? Okay, so that's a really good point. Uh, when we specialize and we learn, we can usually get better performance. So why is it the case that when we do multiple tasks, we might actually get better at each of them separately? And that comes back to the idea of that the, the tasks have to have some relationship to each other, okay? If I ask you to be able to uh, read fast while uh, patting your head and then also rubbing your tummy and cycling at the same time, it's not likely that doing all those tasks uh, will get you better at each of them because they don't have a lot of overlap, okay? Where we think uh, uh, joint learning or multitask learning helps is when those tasks uh, actually overlap a little bit. So for example, in natural language, there are common things that we do in NLP. Like we want to know, uh, for example, question entering, we might want to know whether there's a specific type of question being asked, like what, when, where, or, or how. We might want to know what are uh, noun phrases uh, that could answer like uh, questions about what or when, okay, because Typically, some answers are actually uh, nouns, okay? And you can see that that information will also help you for, for example, machine translation, right? So uh, knowing nouns or, uh, you know, as units and uh, paying attention to noun phrases might help you better with machine translation. 
So that's a good question uh, that you asked, Joanne. Any other questions that you guys have? Uh, yeah, so I, I believe that for this particular paper, I think they emphasize a lot on uh, the sequence of the tasks that you're supposed to train as well. And they emphasize on training the harder tasks first so you can uh, lead, so it can sort of help you in better training the simpler tasks later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So definitely that's a good observation. There, there are a lot of engineering details uh, that uh, when you do the project, you'll need to get a better handle on. Uh, but uh, I'll put up a disclaimer at the beginning, which is to say uh, research papers tend not to give you very good technical detail. They'll give you the big picture and then just like your lecturer, they'll just leave you alone and say, well, that's good, you go implement it, okay? And the trick in the pudding is then uh, to, to, to be able to figure out why it works in a certain way and not in other ways. So as uh, like Clarence said, maybe it's very important to do the sequence in the right order. Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to go over with a little bit, okay? So now we know a little bit about what this project is about, okay? Uh, and so the motivation is uh, uh, in the introduction section, right? Okay, so what you should be reading for is where they actually talk about the key areas of the paper. And for the purposes of lecture, that is where you want to concentrate when you um, talk about uh, the, the methods, okay? You can talk about the motivation and a little bit about the model, not so much about the results, okay? So in this paper, they mention most of the things that we're interested in uh, right around here, okay? They say to address those issues where um, there are several things going on and I can help, uh, we want to propose uh, this idea of a co-interactive relation network or DCR net, okay? That's going to help with this idea of joint learning, two different things that are related, okay? And the key technology that they want to put forward is this uh, idea of a co-interactive relation that layer, right? Okay, so uh, what we want to do is read this paper then to get a better understanding of what that represents, okay? Um, they go on to say a little bit more about uh, what, what type of things uh, they have in these types of relation layers. And so we're gonna see that in a, in a couple of seconds. They actually are referring to, it sees here, uh, three different uh, methods of creating these relationship layers, okay? Uh, like I said earlier, we don't really care so much about um, uh, experimental results. So we're not gonna generally talk about uh, discussions about the output because uh, you know, um, that's just a validation. What we want to know is uh, the motivation, what are the models behind it, okay? All right, so uh, you know, keep this paper uh, in your download tab or whatever, read it as we're talking and discussing uh, as well, okay? All right, so if you go onto the next page, you'll see this figure, okay? It's basically their idea of how they're going to do this system, all right? And um, for those of you fairly new to NLP, it has three uh, basic parts. Uh, two parts are very standard, so I'll just quickly go over those. Um, they are the encoder and the decoder, okay? So the encoder is basically taking natural language utterances, okay? In this case, we have a sequence of uh, uh, utterances. So these are tokens in the stream, word one through word n, and then for the next turn, word one through word n, et cetera, okay? And what we want to do is pass them into uh, our uh, uh, algorithm to create a uh, representation, okay? That representation uh, is basically capturing everything that we want to know about the natural language in a way that's sensitive to our task. Okay, so to do that, um, what we are going to use is uh, this stuff over here, okay? So uh, it says uh, we have the utterances, U1, U2, U3, just like on the previous page. And we're going to pass them through a neural network called a by LSTM, okay? I don't really care what that means right now. It's just uh, basically a sequence encoder, which is going to output a vectorized representation of the text. By vector, I just mean something that has, uh, um, uh, you know, some some floating point numbers, uh, okay, like this. 
all the way until some dimension d and that represents uh, an utterance okay so we're changing strings into uh vectors of floating point numbers and that floating point number vector represents what is said in that utterance okay so that's what a, a encoder does a hierarchical oh, I've got a encoder. quick question just wondering i haven't read the paper but what is u1 u2 u3 exactly is it a sentence or word or okay uh, so phrase? that's a good question so we can go back to the paper right so uh u1 u2 u3 refers to the things that you can see uh, at the beginning here, okay? So um, U1 might be the first utterance, okay? Uh, let's see, where did my pen go? Okay, uh, here, okay. U2 might be this one here. So we're gonna take a series of utterances, separately encode each utterance through a bi -LSDM. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. So, um, you know, to do that, I actually have to take the utterance, segment it into words. So like word one would be they, second word would be are, second word would be as, okay? Uh, we're not gonna go over it that much, but then these words themselves are put into a vectorized form of representation through embedding. So if you don't know what an embedding is, that will be part of the, the self-study that you need to do, okay? So after embedding, uh, taking these words and their embedded representation, we run them through a, a bi-directional long short-term memory encoder, which reads the utterance from forward to, to back and then from and in another direction from back to forward and constructs two different representations of uh, this utterance. Those are then glued together, okay? And then uh, that is the output representation, which you can see on this slide here, okay? This form, okay? And these are going to be sent into a hierarchical encoder which is then going to go through a neural network and then compose these together uh, using uh, self-attention in order to find out which parts of the utterances are important to themselves, okay? So I'm not gonna go over that in too much detail, but uh, just to say that after we do that, uh, what we want to do is take these representations. So what we have at the end of this process so far of encoding, okay, up to here, all right, is a representation of all of these utterances, okay, U1, U2, U3, okay, and they have been uh, encoded into a, a single representation, and now we're uh, going to uh, create systems that are going to be used for uh, dialogue act uh, classification, as well as for sentiment analysis, okay. And uh, the whole part of this paper is that we want to get to the part uh, where we decode, okay? Where we want to use the representations and decide whether a dialogue is in fact, uh, a particular utterance in a dialogue is a agreement or a question or um, you know, a statement. So that's the, the green part, the dialogue act label, or you know, whether it is a positive or a negative or a neutral uh, utterance, that's the, the blue part, right? And uh, the part that they're introducing, if you can understand from the paper, is this stuff in the middle. So that's the key part that they want to, to say is new. Okay, everyone with me so far? Any, any questions or concerns? So uh, do go ahead and share on the general channel, or uh, if you're not quite sure about what's going on, you can scribe it into the document, anything helps so that we can get a, a good, a better understanding of what you guys understand or don't understand. Okay. Um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the D and the S are like, seems like from the paper, they are copies of each other. Uh, am I right? Especially uh, if, you, if you look, the D and the S in the figure, right? Uh, just before the relation layer. Uh -huh. They seem to be copies of each other. They are not separate representations, or they're not they are not obtained separately, but just after the utterance level self attention, then you get DNS. Right is here. it? Right. Yeah. Is it deliberate, or uh, why is it done this way, and then why is it depicted as two different boxes here? Yeah, I think so, they're just saying that uh, you will have the same uh, representation at the beginning, right? But because uh -huh. uh, 
we are going to actually decode at the end over here, right? Uh, yeah. We can do the back propagation uh, from here backwards to, to uh, fine tune how the relationship layers are going to encode it. Yeah, I, I think you are right up to, to say that the, um, the, the representation at this first DNS stage are identical. Um, but I, I haven't read the paper in so much detail. I, I looked at it for about 15 minutes before coming to class. So um, those of you who are reading the paper now, uh, you can take a look and see whether that's the case, okay? So we can read a little bit of it together, right? So it says here, we are going to do dialogue act recommend, uh, recognition. Um, we're doing it using a BIOSTM. Um, and then we do some uh, self-attention. Okay, so for self-attention, I'll try to cover that in a little while, okay? Um, that's uh, using the formulation from the transformer paper. Um, and then um, you end up with uh, the dialogue act and the sentiment representations as input, right? So it says over here, but it doesn't say that they're any different from each other at the beginning. So I think you're right, Abhinav, to say that D and S at the beginning are exactly the same. Right. Are identical. But they are parameters of the network. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to go to uh, this part about self-attention. Okay. Uh, and then uh, co-attention, which is what they proposed. So self-attention uh, has to do with attention in general. So maybe we should talk about why, why attention is important. So there are lots of different uh, blog posts out there. Here's one from um, this blog. Uh, many people have read this one from Jay Alamar on the Illustrated Transformer. So this is a really good piece as well. So uh, I, I encourage you to put links uh, in the Slack channel as well as in the uh, notes uh, to help people understand what it means, okay? So um, basically, if we go back to this uh, other paper, uh, the attention uh, one, okay? The idea was uh, attention has to deal with looking at an input and then trying to decide what is important about it, okay? So um, uh, by attending to a word, we know that other things are more important than others, okay? So uh, for example, in natural language processing, we uh, usually think about some words being dependent on another one. That's called the dependency parsing. So something that's dependent on another one will have high attention, okay? That means that particular other word in the sentence gives a lot of clue or information about how to interpret another word, right? So it says here, one word attends to another word in the same sentence, uh, but with uh, different interest, okay? So the word green here, uh, because it modifies apple, it has a more uh, high attention to apple, not that important that whatever they're eating is green, okay? So uh, green doesn't pay a lot of attention to uh, eating uh, and vice versa, okay? So the idea between uh, encoding uh, using a attention is to try to address that a little bit, okay? Um, to, to, to get some idea about which words are more important to each other. And this happens also in machine translation, right? So if you can think about alignment, where we want to align words uh, from different uh, sentences and different languages to each other, the ones with high attention would be the ones that are actually parallel, right? The ones that are translations to each other. Okay, so uh, you can do attention across sentences, but you can also do it within a sentence. So there are a couple of different models that come from uh, attention. Uh, so you can take a, a simple dot product that is uh, like the ones that you see here. Okay, the additive and location-based ones are all uh, very simple models where you you multiply the two uh, scores together and the product tells us whether uh, that is important or not. Okay, and it's sometimes a tunable parameter. So there could be a W that is learned from gradient descent to gives us that information. Okay, uh, but what was popularized in the transformer model is this idea of um, 
a query, a key, and a value. Okay, so uh, we're going to go look at that for a second. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask uh, some of our WING students, uh, because you guys have covered it a couple times already, to explain what we mean by query key and values um, to understand what, what is the transformer doing that is doing uh, attention. Okay, anyone from uh, our group or anyone who, who knows what is the attention, uh, the transformer attention doing? What do we mean by query key and value? Uh, I, I think there are three matrices and then uh, each word has an entry in a matrix. And when, when calculating the attention, we are using queries to match the keys and then to get some weights and then uh, retrieve values from the matrix. Okay, so um, yeah, that's right. So Tongyao explained that, you know, we want to use words um, in the utterances as queries. And then what we're using with this query, as you can think of it like a, a query that you would type in the search engine and keys would then be like documents, right? Documents that you want to rank, okay? So some of those documents are gonna be more relevant than others. So when the key multiplied by the query gives a high score, okay, like here, uh, the thinking one gets a high score compared to machines, then we know that um, the query and the key matched well, okay? And what we're going to do is instead of returning the value, we're, uh, sorry, returning the, the scalar value, like 112 here, what we want to use is return the value that's coded. Okay, so that, that's what's going to happen here. Okay. So you can uh, pass this through. Basically, you can see the whole process here. Um, so um, on the left, uh, we have, sorry at, the, sorry, at the top, we have two words. And um, by looking at a particular query, okay, like a query of word one, okay, whatever that word one happens to be here, it happens to be thinking. Okay, what we want to know is whether uh, thinking is important uh, for which document or which key. Okay, so we have two words here as keys, uh, machine and thinking. And then we're gonna retrieve their uh, key representations as K1 and K2 and multiply that against the query K, uh, Q1 to get a score, okay? So that score is gonna be normalized. That's what the division is for. And then the softmax after that so that we get a probability score out of it. So here there's only two, two things to normalize against. So we actually have, um, uh, you know, 88 to uh, 12, okay? And then so the uh, thinking is uh, tending to itself more than it is to machines. Then uh, we multiply that times its value uh, representation, right? The value representation is over here. Okay, this one, all right. And then uh, we get uh, these two together. Okay, the 88 times this uh, and output a Z value. Okay, so that's just saying um, the output of this process after doing the attention mechanism is another representation, Z1, that represents that thinking is actually attending more to itself than to the other words. Okay. So um, it may take a little while to give an idea about what, what's going on, but it's basically saying that for each word, we want to see how its representation should not just be limited to itself, but to the words where it is dependent upon or words that depend on it. Okay, so if you go back to this example of, um, uh, I don't think it was in this sentence. Yeah, it was in the other one where you saw green and eating. Okay, um, then uh, these pieces of information, uh, when you think about the word green, it has a little bit to do with uh, more to do with apple than eating. But all of these words play a ten, uh, play a role in interpreting what the word green means in context for this particular utterance. Okay, so that's what we're doing using self attention. Okay, it's uh, again a little bit like what um, this was saying here when we're talking about vision. When we look at a, a a, an image, we also do 
attention. We are trying to not interpret regions of the image uh, by itself. You know, it has to be in relationship to the other things going on, right? We've all seen uh, optical illusions when uh, if you change the context of the image or the part of the image, your interpretation of the image changes, right? So uh, you can uh, get uh, interesting effects with uh, optical illusions where the same gray levels interpreted as different colors depending on context, for example. Okay. So um, the part where we have cross attention has to do more with this part where we have actually a number of different uh, modalities, right? Text as well as uh, images and trying to look at uh, uh, co-attention, okay? So looking at how one part of the image might correspond to one part of the text. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to say much more about that because I'm taking too long. Uh, but basically, that's the idea behind the co-attention network, okay, where we have, um, like I've said here, um, this idea that you might have one modality or one problem. This is a visual, but it could also be like, say, dialogue state. Okay, so you could say this is dialogue state. Okay, and this might be sentiment analysis. Okay, so if we have these two things, uh, then we can say, well, one representation is helping the other and we want to be able to cross the representation so that they can share some way of looking at each other's uh, output to, to get uh, better um, understanding. Okay, so uh, that's uh, the general part behind this paper. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about the, the model itself and, and what they did, but one thing that I, I do wanna share with you is uh, what they found out about uh, what's happening, okay? So um, these two diagrams on the bottom represent uh, how uh, they introspected the attention values when looking at the two tasks. So here uh, you can see there's a big blue vertical stripe at number four, okay? And that number four has to deal with uh, this utterance here, okay? They are as tired of social media as I am. So this is going back to what I was asking at the very beginning about why is joint learning between dialogue act and sentiment important? And I think uh, Ashrin said that, you know, in this case, it's uh, important to know that the fifth statement is an agreement because the agreement lets us propagate the negative polarity in the pr uh, first uh, utterance to the second one. Okay, so that's a direct result of uh, this being an agreement. Okay, in this case, uh, we can see that the high values of uh, attention in number four means that uh, we are using a lot of attention on the fourth utterance to help determine the sentiment or the dialogue in the fifth one. So it has that interaction through uh, different utterances. This is why you see the uh, large blue stripe on, the, on that uh, region, okay? So um, I'm not going to talk any more about the paper because I'm out of time, uh, but uh, if you have other questions, then please uh, ask. Okay, there's a lot more to this paper, but I wanted to give you a, an idea about the basic concepts first. Uh, hi, Prof. Uh, can I just clarify for self-attention, uh, there is no output label that you're comparing to, right? You're just comparing to the inputs that are present together with it. That's right. So self-attention really does mean paying attention to the other inputs that are passed together with you, right? So if I have an utterance or a sentence, it means paying attention to the other words that are in the sentence, okay? Yeah, so if you take any sentence, like the any one of the ones that I showed you earlier, then there are certain sentence, uh, certain words that are more important to interpreting uh, any one of those words, okay? So for example, if I say something like uh, the man jumped over the fence, okay? In order to interpret the man, right? Man is dependent uh, on jumped and fence because those are the important parts of the sentence. So the attention on those words would be more important for the interpretation of that, okay? Like if you say over, uh, over the fence, for example, 
then it would be attending to uh, words that have some meaning to do with over, right? So man wouldn't be so important, eater would duh, but probably fence would be important, right? So it's the idea that uh, certain words in their interpretation would need to know something about the near words. Okay? If we think about understanding words individually, that's without attention, okay? So when we think about word embedding, okay? Generally, this is what without attention, meaning that when I see the word fence, that's just fence. I have a prototypical idea of what a fence looks like, okay? And that's what it is. But when I do it in context, I say the red fence or I, I went fencing or whatever, okay? All of those different words, they have meaning in context, okay? There's contextual word embeddings, which is a different thing, but uh, you know, trying to do this online computation of what is important for words representation in a particular context is handled by self-attention. Okay, don't worry if you don't wrap your head around everything. I'm sure there are lots of people who are on the call who are much more lost and that's okay. Uh, that, that's part of the reason why uh, when you're uh, participating in this research group and, and discussion group, we can help clarify. All right, so I'm going to hand the time back to our coordinator, uh, Yi Song, who will direct us to our next uh, lecture. Okay, so thanks, Prof. Min, very much for your introduction on the Triple I paper and your uh, your guidance on us to how to read the paper. So let's welcome our next speaker, who will talk about dialogue management. Uh, she is a guest uh, visitor, also a PhD student to our group. Her name is Xu Lin. Xu Lin. Yeah. And she will cover a new paper in ICLR. Yeah, please join me and welcome. Okay, thank you, Yisong. Um, okay, I, I, I will share the screen first. You can, can you see the screen now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, hello everyone, good afternoon, uh, nice to meet you. And my name is Xu Ling, and the, the paper I want to share today is the dialogue graph, uh, which deal with how to uh, incorporate interpretable strategy graph networks into negotiation dialogues. Um, okay, before we start, uh, before we start to introducing this paper, uh, let's talk a little about the dialogue management. Um, if you have some background or, or read some tutorial uh, of the dialogue system, you will know that dialogue management is very important part for the dialogue system because it decides how coherent and uh, reasonable the generated dialogue can be. Uh, here are the policy learning and sequence to sequence are two track of two tracks of uh, 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 dialogue, uh, dialogue, dialogue management uh, um, method. You will know that dialogue. Okay. Um, uh, this policy learning is uh, uh, is uh, mainly used in the task oriented dialogue system. Uh, it uh, decides uh, the next next response to action based on the current state and try to mi maximize the future reward. Uh, with this policy. And as for the sequence to sequence, uh, actually uh, current, many current uh, LP tasks use this structure. Um, and so does the dialogue system. Um, uh, actually in this structure, the dialogue ma management is implicitly uh, uh, modeled. We cannot uh, 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 see the, the, the process of management. Um, but the paper I want to present today uh, is based on sequence to sequence structure, but it, want, it tries to explicitly model the dialogue management um, process. Okay, let's just dive into the, uh, the paper. Um, the task that the paper want to deal with is a buyer seller negotiation task. They want, th these two partners want to negotiate on the price of an item through the chat interface. Um, as, we, as you know, it's very important in such a conversation because both the partner want to uh, 
uh, make a deal in a pre in their preferred prices. So um, uh, so the strategy used in this dialogue is very important. So uh, let's just look at this example uh, uh, on the right. Uh, first, the buyer uh, that is a person, and the seller is our chatbot. Uh, the buyer want to buy a a, a winner player uh, in a lower price. But uh, how can our chatbot response? Uh, there are two kinds of responses. The first is the one without strategy, uh, without using some, uh, some good strategy. Uh, the response is not possible. Uh, I can do 35, you all have to pick it up. But the, the response from the buyer is reject. That means this is a if this is a fair deal, they cannot do the business because uh, the buyer reject. Um, but for the one with strategy, uh, the response is I can do 30, 38 and I'll throw a couple of bitter, bitter records for your bro. Here the chatbot considers uh, the strategy of family, informer, propose and trade in to generate such a response. Uh, so the buyer do uh, uh, make uh, agree the deal even with such a higher uh, price compared to the thirty five. Uh, this is why the strategy is very important. Here the chatbot considers this is a gift for family and uh, he can do trade in. That means he can use some old stuff to make up for the price difference. So um. Okay, we then I think we can have a, a general overview for the task. Okay, then uh, this is a formalization for this task. Here the D is uh, the dialogue. Uh, the U1, DA1 and ST1 means the utterance, the course dialogue X and also, and the, and the strategy, strategy in this utterance. Here, the dialogue act and the strategy can be multiple uh, kind. So it's a set. And uh, this page is about uh, the strategies used in the, uh, in this, in the data set for this paper. And you can just uh, overview this, like invent of options for mutual gain or build trust. That means like, um, communicate politely, talk informally, like something like this. Okay. Um, then we, we turn to the main topic. Um, here, this, this framework is what used in this paper. Um, it actually can, uh, consists with, uh, with uh, several modules. First is the utterance encoder. Uh, it encodes the dialogue history, uh, each, uh, each utterance in the dialogue history with an encoder like a uh, transformer or RN, something like this. And then we can get the hidden state for each utterance. And this hidden state is then concatenated with the two output from the structure encoder. Um, these two structure encoder are for strategies and dialogue X. They are totally same. We can just fo focus on one of them. Um, the first, uh, we can see the left one. Um, it consists of two parts. First is the graph encoding. That is, uh, that, that is G graph attention neural network. And, and also a graph pooling module. We can talk this structure later. So um, with this three part utterance embedding, we fed it into the utterance decoder and the utterance decoder will generate the final response. This is an overview for the framework and we let's turn to the structure encoder. Uh, the structure encoder uh, is uh, composed of three steps. First, uh, since we don't know, I don't know how these strategies are related to each other. So um, this paper tried to build a graph for these strategies. They, they try to form the direct edges from 
some utterance to another utterance by the sequential order in the history. That means we can see the picture in the, uh, uh, in the bottom. Here, the utterance one with the strategy inquire will point to the utterance two, utterance three, and utterance four. And the utterance two point two four and the three to four. In, in such a way, in, in this way, we got a graph. And this graph will then uh, will, will then be deals with uh, the graph attention neural network. That means this uh, all the nodes will do the message passing to each other. And, and then this output from the graph attention network will be fed into the graph pooling module. And then, uh, then, then we got the output from the structure encoder. Here, the, the graph pooling, also named as ASAP uh, module, it actually learns some important clusters and try to summarize the graph information to get a, a good uh, output. We can see how it works. And actually, this adaptive structure aware pooling is, a, is a, 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 a structure proposed by another paper. Uh, it's also recent, like 20, uh, uh, published in 2020. Um, um, uh, for the for the ASAP uh, module, we can see from the picture. First, we have our input graph, and this input graph will have some subgraphs. Like uh, here, we mentioned uh, we we name as clusters. Uh, we will compute the scores for each clusters, and then rank these clusters to get some more important ones, and and. Those top K clusters will then form a new graph or the more important subgraphs. And, and this new graph will be the output. Uh, here in this paper, um, uh, this GCM plus ASAP can be repeated uh, for several times. But in this paper, I think they just use for one time. So this ASAP is just like the pooling in convolution uh, neural networks because it it aggregates different informations together and select maybe select may select the more important ones to 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 uh, for the downstream tasks. Okay, then I think we finished the structure encoder and then we turn to the decoder and the loss. Um, here, the decoder is very simple. They just use the GRU cell and, uh, and uh, uh, generate word by word. Uh, the difference is that they use the HT as the input. HT is, is just the, three, uh, the, the, the output from the utterance encoder, structure encoder. And this is a three part uh, uh, embedding, embeddings. And then, uh, I think the key key point is how they uh, de, uh, how they form the loss functions. Um, uh, there are too many loss functions here. Um, uh, LST and LDA are just the the cl classification loss functions for the strategy and dialogue act. Um, uh, here the the loss function is uh, is. Uh, very easy to understand. They are just negative log likelihood. Uh, something need to mention here is the delta and the rho da. Um, they are they, they are actually the weight for different classes. Um, since in in the classification task, um, the 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 sample for different classes are not balanced. Some class has more samples and some class has a uh, fewer. And, and if we don't make a weight, uh, the, the, the class with more samples will, uh, will constitute more, uh, constitute, constitute a larger part of the loss function. So in this paper, they use a weighted uh, neg negative log likelihood. Here, the delta is like this, is an instance not having strategy J and 
uh, uh, divided by the number of instance ha having strategy J. That means if the strategy has much sam uh, have a large number of samples, then the the delta for this this strategy will be low, and the loss for this uh, strategy will be high. That means um, they don't that 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 means this. Uh, model didn't don't in, uh, encourage the prediction for the class with larger number of samples. So, uh, in, uh, to some degree, this this weight um, balanced the uh, the the classes. And then, uh, except for these two loss, and then is the generation loss is just a. Uh, uh, normal generation loss. And then is the, the uh, outcome prediction loss, the LR. Uh, here the R means, uh, uh, how, here R we can see the, the formula here is the sale price minus buyer target price divided by the list price minus buyer target price. Um, that means if we get, get a higher sale price, the R will be larger. So uh, in in this in uh, for in this model, Z divided the R value into five uh, range. That means five classes, and then try to use the HT. That means the encoder output to predict the class for the final sale price. And and the final losses is just uh, uh, the weight, uh, weighted sum of these these four losses and they and in this paper they try to different hyperparameters to make a better result so uh, okay. I'll just mention quickly uh, on Shu's slide here is that you're overwhelmed by the math don't worry uh, this is very typical for papers uh, to have a lot of symbols but they actually uh, boil down to very simple things. Uh, so uh, a loss function, as you probably already know, is a case where you're trying to optimize something, right? So you, you want to make sure that um, when you train the system, it gets better and better at, at making sure it minimizes the losses, right? And so uh, you can see in this formulation here, the last line is basically very similar to what we talked about before in the previous paper that I presented, okay? where there are, are, are several different types of considerations, individual things uh, that are being considered and then bundled together in a linear equation um, to try to optimize. And because we don't know which things are more important than each other, we use a neural network with tunable parameters to try to figure, figure that out uh, from, a, from a, a data-driven point of view. Now then uh, the component losses, the four lines above that, are uh, things that you'll see over and over again, uh, but in various different guises. So there's uh, um, uh, uh, cross entropy loss there, there's uh, you know, binary classification loss, uh, some things that are um, done uh, using uh, a, a logarithmic loss, uh, meaning that small amounts may uh, count uh, bigger effect than larger amounts. So don't shy away too much from the math, don't need to understand all of the symbols, okay? Because uh, I think when we read these papers uh, uh, the first couple of times, um, you, you may want to study every single detail, but it's actually not necessary. Uh, the more papers you read and the more loss functions you see, the more you will start to make friends with them. You won't, you won't be so, um, you know, put off by all of the math. So I think that's, that's one thing I want to communicate to you is that after you read enough of these papers, even though you're not very familiar with the mechanics, you will see, start to see very common paradigms about how to do things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I can I ask a question regarding this yeah. loss function? So ultimately the objective is to minimize these loss functions, right? So are they sort of summed up using a tuning parameter in a way so that we are Max, uh, minimizing the total loss of all of these, or how does that work? Yeah, that's exactly right, uh, Clarence. So 
we, we are going to sum them all together. That's what the last line on, on Lynn's slide looks like, right? So you have uh, a loss for the NLG. So what are the, uh, the, the generated language looks good. Okay, whether the strategy was successful, uh, whether the, uh, I forget what DA stands for, um, and whether the price is a reasonable price. So all of these are four different considerations, uh, yeah. which we want to have as a good uh, response, a, a good um, dialogue with the system. So, uh, you know, when we have a success, these numbers will be lower for each of the losses. And to set which loss is important, we're going to use these tuning parameters the alpha, the beta, and the gamma, right? So the first NLG one has, uh, um, you know, a, a parameter of one, you can say. And then the alpha, beta, and gamma are, are set to whatever the neural network uh, finally optimizes against. Yeah. Um, might also ask a question here. Of Please course. go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether I got it entirely correct, but, um, why is it the case that when the, sample, when the sample size is large, we would prefer to give it a smaller weight? Um, yeah, if, if uh, you mean the delta uh, value, yeah, uh, if, if, if the strategy has more samples, uh, the, the delta for this uh, strategy will be, will be low. And then if we put, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we put into this LST uh, formula, the the loss the loss for this class will be high. Anyway, because because it's a negative, there is a negative uh, uh, symbol here. So if the loss is, is high, that means we don't we don't encourage the model to predict this class. Okay, okay, all right, thanks. Sorry. Okay, I also encourage all of you when yeah. you look at loss functions to try to just look at the math for, uh, um, you know, alone for a second, and then try to guess what the, you know, natural language description of that loss is trying to do. Okay, this is a, a good way to think about it. Sometimes, uh, you know, we, we tend to choose uh, methods of re re representing loss that are simple and, and then also easy to optimize, right? So when we think about easy to optimize, it would mean has a gradient, right? Because then we, we can use a neural network, a stochastic gradient descent to get at it. So um, those are uh, the types of things that you normally see. So um, yeah, uh, try for each of those four lines, uh, for example, could you write down a sentence about what that loss represents and why is the formulation written the way it is, okay? And then you can check your answer with the answer key, which is in 2-4, uh, right? 2.4 of model training of the paper. Um, there, they're more exact, and, and that's why papers are hard to read when you have to be exact. But sometimes it's more helpful to, to get an intuitive understanding of what it's doing, okay? Rather than the exact one. The exact one is helpful when you're replicating papers. Um, but when you're trying to uh, intuit why the paper is structured that way or why the model is structured that way, it's good uh, to have a, a more general understanding. Okay, Lynn, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, I just move to the next page. Um, okay, they, uh, then we finish the model and this is the experimental result for this model. Um, here, uh, uh, they, they actually do two, um, two tasks. First is the uh, strategy and dialogue act classification task. And second is the generation. Uh, the, let's look at the upper table. Um, since the strategy and X are multiple, uh, there are uh, several X or strategy for one utterance. So the, the tasks is a multi-label classification task. So they use the macro, micro, and the AOC, AUC, uh, this kind of evaluation metrics for this task. Uh, here we can see uh, the L model actually do, some, do better, uh, actually, actually perform better than others. But here, uh, let me introduce what these three baselines. 
the fourth F E H E D uh, is a uh, is is actually uh, use a finite state trans transducer to model the strategy relations. And uh, for the HED plus RN or transformer, they use the RN and transformer to uh, model the relations uh, among the strategies. Uh, uh, as we can see, this uh, transformer also do some good, good job for these evaluations, uh, especially for the macro, macro F, F1. This, uh, this macro evaluation uh, is, is, kind, uh, is actually um, measures how uh, the motor performs in other classes. But for the micro evaluation, it, it measures how the motor performs in all the samples. That means the macro evaluation uh, uh, measures a, a more balanced uh, uh, accuracy or some, some other eva uh, evaluations. It's more balanced uh, among these classes. So we can see the HED plus transformer can do uh, such a, a, a good, uh, can uh, make such a good result. And uh, and and I think uh, we can just see this. Uh, uh, there is some random results. I don't know. Uh, we can just move to next table uh, for the generation. And here the generation part, uh, dialog graph uh, also do do a great job. Uh, and S H E D transformer also do uh, do a great job, especially for the um, the RCACC, that means the racial classification accuracy. That, that is the, the uh, LR we mentioned in last page. Um, here, the transformer do better work in the uh, pre outcome prediction. Uh, I think um, maybe this, since transformer is also a, a, a because it also used the attention um, structure. That means it connect all the strategies, uh, full, all the strategies are fully connected and they, this model tries to learn the, uh, the relations with this uh, attention uh, structure. So it can do a great job, I think is understandable. Um, but this dialog graph may, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, JT plus ASAP uh, uh, model could do better, maybe. Uh, and the, the bottom right table is the ablation study for this, uh, this model. Uh, it, uh, it, it does the experiment without a strategy without strategy and dialog X and the without uh, STDA and also and the BERT encoder. Um, but I think this, uh, they lack something, they lack something for the ablation study because uh, they don't give how uh, this GAT plus ASAP can do for this task. Uh, if they can do a experiment on uh, on the on on the on this kind of uh, a model without ASAP or without uh, GAP or uh, GAT or using some other G graph neural networks, uh, we can learn more about how can structure can uh, this graph structure can do uh, for this task. And okay. Uh, then we just move to next page. Uh, here is the uh, visualized the result for uh, this this model. Uh, uh, let's look at the upper uh, picture. Um, here, the the graph is the visualized one from this uh, uh, the 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 structure encoder part. Here we can see the trade in. Uh, and the proposal strategy in the utterance five is 
highly influenced by the informal strategy in the uh, utterance three parts, uh, utterance three, utter, uh, 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 utterance three, and then the the positive uh, attitude from the utterance four. That that is the attitude from the buyer. Inf highly influenced the informal uh, strategy in the utterance five. The utterance five is, is from the chatbot. Uh, I think this is very intuitive because if the buyer is very positive, positive with current price, uh, I think the the chatbot don't need to propose any other price and uh, any other price. So it's just do some information part. So uh, from this picture, we can know this, this graph structure actually learns some uh, uh, right topic transition uh, probabilities. And uh, here the bottom table is some a quanti quanti quantitized uh, result. We can see the concern is more related to politeness and the uh, hedge. The hesitation is more, co uh, hesitation from the buyer is more uh, uh, connected to the propose or friend uh, strategies. And I think it do learn something with this structure. And, and then we can, uh, if you have some questions, you can ask them. If no, we can go next. Um, okay, next. Uh, here is the human evaluation result in this, in this table. Uh, something strange here is the, uh, that, that is different from the, uh, the automatic evaluation is the dialogue graph, the, the, the utterances generated by the dialogue graph is not that nature compared to the HED. Here, HED is just this, this model without a strategy and dialogue act. That means a, a normal sequence to sequence um, uh, model. That means uh, that maybe from this we can see uh, because we add something to the decoder uh, with, uh, in the dialogue graph model. Maybe it, it, it could influence the generation of the, uh, the, the original sequence to sequence model. Okay, next. Okay, this is the, uh, uh, the generated result. Uh, by different method. Uh, we can see the dialogue graph uh, get higher uh, sale price compared to the transformer. But, um, but for the FEHED, uh, -E um, is compared to the, 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 the the sentence gener generated by the dialogue graph is very, um, um, is, uh, the, the, the price is lower, I think. And for the HED, uh, you just produce some uh, re repetitive response. response. And uh, it could, I, I think this HED cannot understand the, the current context. Okay, then, okay, this is the, uh, this is some, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, hi, sorry. Uh, I actually have a question with regards to like the previous case. So like for all of these case, uh, uh, which one, uh, this? Oh uh, yeah, this for, for this slide, yeah. So, so like for all of these uh, cases, right? It seems like the offer happens. So like, uh, like one thing which I wanted to ask, right? Uh, in, in relation of how exactly uh this this problem is being modeled, right? Is that a case where like the the offer doesn't happen, and like how exactly is it being modeled in here? You you mean uh if the offer offer didn't happen? You mean... As in as in like uh the negotiation breaks down. Like for example, the 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 bot says even though uh like for example uh I can't go that low, and then uh. 
the the human con- continue to insist that like uh uh there is I think uh, oh that that will be a, a a failure I think that the deal will be failed. Uh, as as in like uh how is it being captured uh in in the loss functions and and uh in in this entire uh model cost like I I don't I don't quite get how that's being captured in here. Oh, you mean how if in this situa- situation how can uh the loss function get this? Uh, as in like uh if if there is a failure, then uh how how exactly does that loss function uh is able to uh. Uh, learn from from the failure itself. It seems like it's all getting like uh, uh, like negotiations which are successful. Yeah. Um, actually, I think this is very very detailed uh, 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 part. Um, I think uh, how can let's see the loss function here. They want to uh, predict the. Uh, the class, the the class of the ratio, by this model, but the 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 situation you mentioned lies in which which of the class? Maybe this is uh, if if we can know the answer for for this, we can I can answer your question. But I don't know how they put the failure in which class. Ah, uh, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I think I think that was that was the exact question which which I uh wanted to to ask about uh in relation to how exactly is the failure being uh classified? Cause cause it yeah. doesn't seem to be covered uh, under all of these loss functions. Um, you, you mean, uh, I think I have answered your question because yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I don't I don't know. Uh, I don't know how they put the failure into which class one to five. If uh, I think they they will do something to this situation because um, I, I think failure is also very important for the strategy. Okay, thank you. I do you have some other questions? Okay, let's come to the last page. Uh, here is some summary uh, from me. Uh, here, first one is that uh, such a structure-based model could help better learn the task logic. Uh, from this paper, we can learn this because uh, this uh, st- structured, uh, structured module can maybe can better, can make the feature space more separable, so it's um, it can do the can model the job better, and then the two and three are um, some uh, are, are two future directions we may need to do in the future. Uh, the first is how can we combine the external knowledge with the learned strategy? Well, in this paper, they are they learn the uh, all the strategy by by the data set. But sometimes we don't have so much data, and uh, how if we can uh, uh, combine the external external knowledge with the learned strategy, and I think is is a good topic. And then the third one is topic guided guided generation. As we can see from the um, this table, the generated sentences is not that nature from the human's perspective. So maybe we can do something for this. Okay. I think oh. this is this is all I want to share. Oh sorry I have a question on structure encoder. Could you please move the slides to okay. it? Thank you. This one? Uh, I think is the next one. Oh okay. Uh, yeah this page uh, because I saw before go into the graph pooling, it will have a graph encoder, which is GAT. And if they go to the graph pooling, we'll have a GCN and ASAP. So I'm wondering the GCN, why the GCN is used for uh, this? 
for this oh. pooling part. Uh, I can I can answer your question here. The GCN is actually the the same as uh, is is GAT here because this is a picture from the the paper proposed ASAP. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in this paper they just use GAT plus ASAP. Here GCN is a, and can be any kind of uh, graph neural network. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Because I was thought after JT, it used GCN, yeah, which means strange. it's a duplicate, a duplicate functional. Yeah, if GAT, it makes sense to me. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so if you are not aware of what GCN and GAT are, uh, GCN is basically the, the overall name for a family of approaches that are, are graphical uh, convolutional neural networks, right? So they're doing a little bit of like what we talked about in cross attention, okay? Where instead of having a sequence of words that needs to pay attention to each other, we actually have a graphical structure, right? Something like uh, in A or B. Uh, and then we want the representation of a node to take into account um, information from its neighbor. So it's very much like attention. So uh, GCN is the vanilla version of this. And then uh, GAT is a, a, a slightly improved version of, of GCN, but they're all known as uh, graphical convolutional neural network family. So you can use the word uh, acronym GCN to, to denote uh, the family of algorithms, including GAT, which is the graph attention. I forget what the T stands for. Um, uh, as a way of just representing structures and then trying to get each node's representation to reflect a little bit of its neighbors. Okay, so don't worry if you don't know all the words, I, uh, you can always ask us if you don't understand the termolo terminology on Slack and we can try to cover it later. Okay, I I'm mindful it's 3.10. So we still have one paper left to cover. Yushi has been waiting for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's good to give, go over more details uh, at the beginning. So I uh, do appreciate it if you'd want to stay on that uh, we finished this reading session with the last paper. Um, uh, over the weekend or so, we'll start to uh, work on the details about how next week's uh, lecture, uh, sorry, next week's uh, project consultation will get started. It'll probably be very short just because uh, you guys haven't formed into teams yet, uh, but we want to give you some time to reflect about what a project should look like. And then we also need to start to determine who is working on a week four. So those of you assigned to week four, um, you can look forward to also working on the presentation together to do something like what we're doing today. Okay, Lynn, do you want to continue? Do you have anything else uh, you want to present? No, 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 I will stop the sharing. Okay, let's give a hand uh, for uh, Lynn for presenting this work. Thanks very much for that. Okay, yeah. then uh, we'll turn it over to the last uh, presenter today. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Um, okay, so um, I will take my turn and now I will um, cover the part of natural language generation in dialogue systems. So um, the paper I want to focus on today is the work done by FAIR and uh, accepted by ACL 2020. And this work uh, applies the unlikelihood loss in dialogue uh, system to address some problems that the standard maximum likelihood cannot address. Okay, so um, before we start, uh, let's think of one of the problems that, um, uh, one of the problems in the general and conventional natural language generation. Uh, that is to say the problem of exposure bias. Here is a simple example of the explorer BIOS problem. Uh, so first, uh, during training, the model can take the ground truth text as input and uh, then predict the next tokens. But while in the testing, the model can only use the tokens uh, it predicts itself uh, as the input. So this 
because the inconsistency between the process of training and testing. And uh, so this caused some problems. Here is a graph of the process of generation in testing. Here the green arrow um, represents the ground truth path um, for the decoding, while the gray ones shows the actual model prediction. So here we can find that um, in the decoding process, when the model decides one step wrong, then chances are that um, it will lead to the totally different results from the um, ground truth results. So um, another problem is that uh, we all know that during training, we can only use uh, one unique question and uh, one unique text as the ground truth. Um, but actually, um, there are a lot of plausible choices for a text. Uh, for example, here the the word the word love could be replaced with like. So there are actually many available choices for the generation, and the process of the conventional NLG cannot take this into account. So. Um, how to address the problem of explorer bias in this case? Uh, let's first look into um, how the likelihood-based process in NLG um, is like. So the task definition is that given the context X in the data system, here the uh, X means the context information. Uh, here S1 to K means the context sentences like the scenario or the knowledge um, required in the dialogue system. And here the U1, 2, T means the dialogue history, uh, the utterance from speakers in the um, com conversation. And uh, then the goal is to predict the next utterance, Y, um, for the dialogue system. OK, so during training, um, conventional NLG states the maximum likelihood estimation as the loss. Uh, here, the uh, loss function is uh, in and uh, is shown in this way, and uh, here the p represents the probability of the generated text um, of the model. So, and um, here the theta means the parameters parameters of the model, and the why is the uh, it's a ground truth utterance. So the key idea here is that in MLE uh, loss, the goal is to maximum the probability of the ground truth utterance um, for the model. However, in um, testing, uh, uh, okay, so, so then we will talk about the uh, method in, in the testing. So in testing, um, the conventional um, uh, the conventional method for decoding um, is a determinist deterministic fashion approach. Uh, that means the like the greedy search or bean search. Um, this ma this method uh, is aimed to uh, just a max ma maximum the uh, probability of the ground truth uh, sentences. So. This, me this method actually depends highly on the um, probability um, predicted by the model. But actually, um, we know that um, sometimes a truly natural or informative um, test may have may don't have um, that uh, much high probability uh, as we expect. Um, so in this case, the model will fall in degeneration. This means that the, mo the model will tend to um, predict some simple, um, simple, safe, but meaningless text, in, in fact. So here, uh, research works have used some stochastic methods to address these problems, uh, such as the top case sampling and nucleus sampling. And the key idea of this method is to introduce randomization um, in the decoding process so that the model uh, is not just to um, maximum the 
probability of the ground truth sentence directly. And there are some randomization here, so um, the model can have the um, chances to generate some informative or more natural text. So the um, so you could refer to this paper for more information about the stochastic um, sampling. Yeah, uh, and there are some samples about the the fact that um, the MLE based model based methods um, that uh, will degenerate reputation uh, in decoding. So problems are that this method, um, despite that we we use the um, competitive method uh, like the GPT-2, which is large scale pre-training model. Uh, although for GPT-2, the model sometimes um, can just um, generate some, and uh, generate many repetition, uh, like the repetition of single word and the first level uh, experience, uh, expressions. Uh, and also the structural repetition, uh, like here, uh, many uh, re repetition of the uh, same sentence. So um, then how to address this problem that standard maximum likelihood cannot address? Uh, here, um, and so, so far we have known that um, the standard maximum likelihood for a uh, fail because um, the probability the model learns during training is uh, not correct because um, the truly natural and the informative text may not have that high probability, in fact. So in, in the NLG of dialogue system, um, there are some problems brought by the standard maximum likelihood. Uh, first, uh, as we have mentioned above, is the uh, reliance on repeated copying, uh, such as the context copying and the uh, utterance repeating. Also, the overuse of frequent words uh, also occur, occur a lot, um, such as um, the model tends to predict the words that uh, have high frequency, um, it, but it's also simple and the meaningless, so it's not correct. Also in this paper, the authors uh, have focused on another um, problem that the model's ability to maintain logical coherence in fact. Uh, there is a simple example um, that uh, here, the first sentence has, has already showed that the speaker loved basketball, but the model still predicts uh, that the, the, the speaker dislikes basketball as well. So this means that the model actually um, do not understand the language they produce, in fact. So how to address these problems in the dialogue system? Uh, let's first look at the original unlikelihood loss, how to define it. So the key idea of the unlikelihood loss is um, to to produce or provide a negative candidate state that the model should uh, um, reduce the probability of this negative candidate during training. So here, the C represents the state of negative candidates. And uh, here we can see that the log, in the log function, uh, here, the, here, the, here is um, one minus P. So the model's aim is to uh, minimize the probability of this negative candidate. And uh, um, this is the graph from the, new, the original um, paper which introduced the unlikelihood loss. Here we can um, look at the, the figure on the right. Here, um, the, purple, the purple shapes um, represent the model that use the unlikelihood loss. Here token and sequence just means the, um, the, the token-wise and the sequence-wise 
uh, unlikelihood loss. And uh, here the um, green shape shows uh, represents the nucleus sampling, which just uh, used the likelihood based um, loss. And also for the pink one, it only used the likelihood loss. So here uh, we can find that the method that's based on um, likelihood loss, they tend to um, predict the most frequent words, but um, tend to not uh, generate the real words. So this shows that the, um, the, the deficiency of the likelihood-based method. And uh, when, when we just incorporate the unlikely loss, uh, we can see that the, the things got, um, the, the problem got addressed. So this shows that the unlikely loss um, can, can be used to address the problem here. Mm, so how to apply the unlikely loss in conversation system? Uh, here is uh, what the author's done. And um, the method is very straightforward that um, for the repetition and copying, since the key idea is to um, reduce the probability of the negative candidate. So the, the key point is to how to define the negative candidate set. And here for the utterance repeated, repeating and the, the context copying, the um, negative candidate set just is just defined as um, the, the fraction or the portion. Um, uh, uh, the, this just defined as, as the, um, the words that may uh, cause repeating or overlapping for the label and context in utterance. So this is a straightforward definition of the, um, of the negative um, candidates for repetition and copy. So then for the vocabulary usage, uh, how to reduce the um, probability of that frequ frequency, frequent words um, in, in training. So here the, other, um, the author's idea is that um, the, when a word's probability um, model, model by the model is higher, than the probability in human distribution, then the model tends to um, over predict this kind of words. So the aim is to uh, reduce the probability of this kind of tokens. So here, um, the uh, negative candidates is just the words itself. And uh, here the, here the, um, the P star, and this this represents the human distribution. And yes, and uh, uh, also here the beta means the scaling parameter for the unlikelihood uh, loss in this case. So uh, we can see that when the probability of the word in the model gets higher, then the 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 loss function tend to penalize. Uh, this this case and uh, um, tend to reduce the probability of this kind of token. Okay, so uh, next um, is the most um, I think it's most challenging part um, for the problems in the uh, NLG. Uh, that is how to uh, address the problem of logical incoherence in NLG. And um, so in this case, the others also th they think of a straightforward way to address it. That is to use the data set of natural language inference. Uh, here, the figure shows an example um, of, the, uh, of the data set they collected. And so they use the entailment and the neutral pairs to be the positive samples and use the contradiction pairs to be the negative samples, uh, which is shown as the D plus and the D minus respectively. Um, so 
steering training, uh, the the others use the standard likelihood for the coherence data set. That means the entailments and the neutral pairs, and they apply the unlikelihood for the incoherent data set, uh, which is the contradiction pairs. So, uh, so that's about the methodology of this paper. Uh, any question yet? So it's good to ask questions, especially when we're going over methodology. So uh, if you have uh, questions to Yushi, please uh, ask. So yeah, you see I'm, I'm a little nervous because this is my first presentation in NUS, so I think. Uh, you're doing fine. Uh, and uh, everyone, I think, uh, appreciates the guidance uh, on, on the paper. Uh, I think the, the key things here are, uh, you know, you can uh, look at uh, the idea of negative sampling and that they've turned it around. They're saying we want to optimize for um, uh, the reverse of likelihood, right? So then the, the way you do this sampling is very important. Uh, so typically you have a lot of positive, uh, you may have a, a small number of positive cases but actually choosing the negative cases as well is actually very, very important. And I think, you know, that that's where they've done a lot of work here to, to try to formalize that and to make it into a, a formal structure of uh, what they want to optimize for. Yeah, so I yeah. think uh, it's, a, it's an interesting paper. Yeah, and uh, oh, I need to mention one thing that's here um, for the contrib contradiction pairs, um, the others just use the unlikelihood loss for this can this kind of cases. But I think that um, they just um, use the token wise loss. That means they reduce the probability of each word in the contradiction um, text. But um, this is not. Um, um, I think maybe this is not. This will not work. In every case, things um, sometimes if just one word we use in the um, sentence that produce the contradiction. But if we just um, reduce all the all the uh, the probability of all the words in the sentence, uh, it may be wrong some, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. So um, you know, this is like you say um, the formulation of this. Uh, a range of C identity goes all the way through a uh, uniform distribution of all the words. So you can say, for example, that you'd like to apply cross attention or just normal attention and then uh, um, exhibit a, a, a um, you know, uh, uneven distribution about which words in the sentence are, are more salient for displaying the contradiction, right? So um, yeah, there's also this type of contrastive behavior that you're trying to do, which is to say, if you have something that's an entailment and uh, you use one of those anchors as the uh, branch for a contradiction. So here in this case here, right, you have, I have two cats, uh, that statement is in common, right? So that statement is uh, basically serving as an anchor uh, for um, the contradiction between the model saying I have two cats and I don't have any pets, right? So um, you can use uh, a contrastive type of loss uh, formulation to also try to optimize that, right? To say that, uh, you know, I want to make the difference between the entailed version and the contradiction version as far apart as possible, right? Um, and then to uh, uh, optimize that. So I, I put, again, uneven costs per word. So that's another thing that can be done. There are lots of these interesting tricks, but this is a, a good first formalization uh, of this idea. Great. And it works, in fact, yeah. Um, yeah, if okay. it didn't work, it wouldn't be published. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, again, when you read papers, don't worry too much about the math yet. Uh, you should be looking for the big ideas. And uh, uh, similarly, when you go create a paper or you do experiments and it doesn't work, it doesn't mean it was a bad idea, okay? It, it could be that your specific formulation is really 
more important. So the, the general idea might be important uh, and, and good, but the execution of that idea, like exactly how you do the math or exactly how you do the pre-processing or, or the um, you know, batch training, et cetera, those things actually matter, unfortunately, a lot. And um, you know, it, when you look at scientific papers, they never mention these things. Okay, this is why we call uh, deep learning the dark art, you know, because there's a lot of things that people don't tell you that are actually very important to get right in order for you to get good results on your experiments. So as a neophyte, if you're new to the area of deep learning and you're doing your first project or your first try at it, don't be surprised if it fails, okay? The, the, the key point there is that you start with a known well-working recipe. So like you go through a tutorial or you use some code and you try to replicate the results. If you replicate it, that's great, okay? Then you have the basis to permute, you know, take baby steps away from that working system to get something else working. It's very rare that unless you have a lot of experience that rolling a complete system on your own the first time is going to work. There are so many things to get wrong. And so if you get any of those wrong, your likelihood of, of getting good performance is tiny, yeah. Um, okay, so so I will go ahead and uh, um, then it's the part of experiment and the data says for evaluation the other used are the conversation AI too. Uh, I, I, I know and to present uh, actually they have already released the third version of it, but in this paper they used the uh, second variant and also they used a uh, knowledge grounded dialogue data set the wizard of Wikipedia. Also, they have used the uh, ELI5, which is a long-term question answering data set. Um, but they use it to um, assess that whether the unlikelihood loss can reduce the um, repetition and copy um, the problems like this in the generation process. So here is the um, sample of the com AI to they have it. Yeah, it's a personal um, conversation they have it, I think. And this is a, um, sam it's a sample from the visa they have it. Uh, in this data set, um, knowledge is used to, uh, is used for the dialogue generation. Yeah. And uh, okay, so uh, here comes the results of the experiment. Um, Firstly, um, for the metrics that to measure the, um, the, the portion and the fraction of label repetition and uh, the context copying, um, the author just designed um, some basic function to calculate um, this, that uh, to represent the adders. Um, so, so the, uh, here the two tables, show the results in the data set of com AI2 and, and wizard. Um, yeah, so in the results, we can show that the unlikelihood loss of the uh, context copying and the label repetition, uh, in fact, uh, do that's good to uh, each other. That means they help to improve the, they help to improve the performance of um, um, each other. And also uh, another thing to mention is that um, when we incorporate the unlikelihood loss, we find that uh, actually the PPL and the F1 score um, does not um, change too much. So that means um, this is a safe, in, a safe uh, this is a safe method that um, do not hurt the performance on PPL and F1 score. Yeah, so and then it's the results on the ELI5. Um, that is similar with the other two data sets. And uh, on the right, uh, here is the, um, the figure and that illustrates the um, relation between the perplexity uh, and the label repetition um, por um, fraction. So here uh, we can see that when we increase the scaling parameter
factor of the unlikelihood loss, the um, the repetition um, torsion can be converged to the human level. Uh, and this is also true for the uh, context repetition. Yeah, and we can see that the um, change on the perplexity is quite smooth. So, so this thing, I think this can demonstrate that the unlikely loss um, works well. Yeah. Uh, so another scenario is the vocabulary usage. Um, here, the human distribution of words is calculated um, by the uh, based on the comma two comma eight eight two training set. Yeah. So the others defined four categories of the um, frequency. So, um, so to assess the performance of the unlikelihood loss, um, here the, um, the others calculate the fraction of tokens in each category um, defined as uh, here, yeah. So we can find that for the MLE baseline, the model tends to predict many more um, frequency words and uh, um, many um, and much less the realist one, a realist one. Uh, and uh, here we can also see that the when we incorporate the unlikelihood loss, um, this this kind of problem can be uh, addressed significantly. Uh, another interesting to mention is that. Here, the alpha parameter, uh, it is increased from uh, one to uh, a thousand. So that means the performance is not quite sensitive to the alpha parameters. Uh, I think it's interesting, but um, because I haven't uh, looked detail into the information, so uh, I don't know why the things happen like this here. But uh, yeah, I think it's worth to think about it. That's why the um, alpha parameters here uh, seems uh, works not that significantly. So this is a point that we can improve, maybe. Yeah. So um, okay. So here is uh, uh, oh okay. So here is um, another figure that shows the relation. Um, between the uh, frequent words cumulative mass and the real words ones. Um, this uh, shows that when we increase the um, scale of the alpha, um, our perform the performance of our model can be converged to the human performance. So this also demonstrates that the unlikelihood loss works well in vocabulary usage. Okay, so then is the last part that um, how the uh, logical, how the problem of logical correct, correctness can be addressed by the unlikelihood loss. So here in the in the paper, the authors uh, developed uh, two utterance generation tasks. Uh, here, the author defines two kinds of entailment pairs. Uh, the first one is um, um, straightforward that um, it just use the positive pairs in the NLI data set. And, uh, uh, and the uh, second one is the triple entailment. And uh, that means if A and B, and uh, they have the entailment relationship and uh, A and C has also has that uh, relationship, then the B and C will be a uh, positive um, pairs. Um, this um, this kind of um, definition, uh, I think, is um, more noisy because sometimes the relation between B and C is not that direct. So uh, there will bring more challenges in for this um, categories. Uh, also, um, for the evaluation, the um, the authors um, develop two ways to evaluate how the uh, model performs on the logical correctness. Uh, first, um, it's, um, uh, it's uh, 
uh, it's accordant with our impression that uh, when when the model gives a higher perplexity for a sentence, that means uh, the model tend not to uh, generate this kind of sentence. So uh, we hope that the model can reduce, uh, can increase the perplexity of those uh, those sentences that have contradictions. And uh, so, and for the second evaluation, um, and this is uh, uh, like A-B testing scenario uh, where the model need to um, assign a, um, a lower perplexity for the positive statement than the negative ones. Okay, and uh, there is another task that um, that's um, setting the whole dialogue scenario, uh, where here we here in the positive pair, um, in each positive pair, uh, the the pair contains both the input contents context X and the uh, output utterance. So, uh, this definition is also like the triple entailment definition that um, the relation, the entailment relation between the context and the utterance is not that um, direct because um, the entailment relationship between uh, depends on some bridge entities or um, bridge texts uh, that uh, have uh, some relationship with each other. So here the um, positive one um, is, uh, so, so here if the um, P1 and P2 pair in the NLI data set, uh, their if their relationship is contradiction, then the sample will be uh, categorized as a negative sample. Yeah, so here is the um, results of the evaluation. And uh, uh, first, we can see that um, for the MLE baseline, uh, it tends to give low perplexity for the contradict samples. Uh, we can see that it's 12.5 uh, just um, next to the, the perplexity for the entailment one. So this, this means that uh, actually in the contradicting pairs in the NOI, and they have said the utterance have high word overlap with each other uh, that can confuse the model and the model will, um, will it will be difficult for the model to um, indicate whether um, they are coherent or incoherent, incoherent samples. So when we uh, incorporate the unlikelihood loss, here we can see that the um, perplexity of the contradict um, contradict pairs increase a lot. So this can also show that um, the simple definition of the unlikelihood loss in in logical correctness scenario is um, is also working. It's also helpful. Yeah, and for the uh, full dialogue, the the results are similar. Here, yeah, and uh, okay. So here uh, we come to our conclusion. So the highlights of unlikelihood uh, in conversation system, I think, uh, can be um, can be um, and can be expressed in this way. Yeah. Um, so firstly, um. It's about the problems of exposure bias that brings the problem of the um, uh, the problems we have mentioned in the uh, NLG. Uh, like, uh, uh, firstly, is how comes the neural text on uh, degeneration? So I have uh, write some of my opinions in the PS, I think. So you can refer it here. So firstly, uh, I think the the the, the degeneration comes from the inconsistency between the training and testing process. And secondly, it's because of the intrinsic property of our 
human language, uh, that means um, a high probability predicted by the model doesn't mean that the text is natural or informative. Uh, also, um, um, in neural models, actually, uh, we cannot say that current neural models have the ability to truly understand the, um, the information, the knowledge uh, in the text. So uh, this comes to the degeneration in current neural analog methods. Uh, so secondly, how randomization decoding uh, method works and fails. The randomizing decoding uh, means the methods of top K sampling and the nucleus sampling. And uh, this, this kind of work uh, use the randomization to try to uh, address a problem that's um, brought by the model probability. And that's to uh, reduce the impact of the model probability in decoding. But however, uh, they, they, is, uh, they are actually um, depend also in, depend on the probability generated by the model. And that means they uh, still uh, increase the probability of the ground truth, ground truth sentence in um, training. So, so in this case, uh, this kind of uh, method may not uh, work as well. And uh, uh, thirdly, how unlikelihood helps in this case. And uh, uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, that is just that the unlikelihood loss um, define the set of negative candidates uh, that uh, try to um, minimize the impact of the uh, maximum likelihood loss in training. So uh, this um, loss, uh, the unlikelihood loss uh, introduce the, um, the method to penalty the model when it generates some sentence we do not want, uh, in fact. And uh, then comes to the um, issues in unlikelihood, unlikelihood loss. So, uh, so in dialogue system, what problems unlikelihood address uh, in this work? Uh, so uh, I think it's uh, straight, I think it's clear that uh, this work address three problems in the uh, in the analogy of dialogue system. First is the reputation and the copying uh, of the decoding process. And the second is the vocabulary usage. The model tend to predict um, words that have high frequency. And thirdly is the most challenging part, the problem of logical um, incorrectness uh, of the generation. Yeah. So, Secondly, how to define unlikelihood loss for uh, each problem, and uh, uh, are there any drawbacks? Um, and from my perspective, I think, uh, firstly, for the uh, unlikelihood of the repetition and the copying problem, um, I think um, sometimes it's hard to define the ngram uh, overlapping, uh, I mean, the hyper parameter of n. Uh, it's hard to define this kind of um, parameters because uh, sometimes it depends on the distribution of the data sets we use to train. So uh, actually in the, uh, in the um, actual information, um, the, the, N, the N-gram, the parameter we set cannot be um, scalable to or be extended to all the data sets in fact. So that, that's a problem that makes the uh, makes this kind of method just constraint in uh, in a um, one or two data sets, I think. Yeah. So uh, another drawback I think is that for the logical logical correctness, as I mentioned that um, it just simply reduced the probability of each word in the sentence, but do not care about the exact word which uh, which just um, 
and cause the contradiction. Um, so, so in this case, the model still cannot understand the, um, the, the, the context or the information in the text actually. So then comes to the future direction. And so I mentioned about uh, actually the unlikelihood loss is just introduced to um, penalty the negative candidates during training. So for the logical and factual consistency, um, current models still cannot truly understand the, um, the language. So, so this is a challenge I think future works uh, need to work on. Um, and then is to correct the coil and the common reasoning error. Uh, this is like the logical and factual consistency. And so, yeah, so uh, I think that's all. Uh, this is uh, what I want to share with you. So any question? Okay, uh, I think uh, since we are really short on time, we're about an hour over, uh, we should stop now. Uh, so let's thank Yushi for her presentation. Okay, so um, you know, some of you may be quite daunted, especially our uh, uh, DYC1401 uh, students. Uh, don't get discouraged. Uh, it is going to be a little bit tough at the beginning, like I said, because uh, a lot of the terminology you don't know and you're challenging graduate level topics but it is quite surmountable. We've had uh, quite a number of students who, who do pretty well at this and uh, I'm not too worried about it. It's just that you have to deal with this, uh, a little bit of anxiety that you're not sure exactly what's going on. And um, yeah, that's why we have a whole group of people. You know, it's not me, the instructor helping you. It's all of your fellow compatriots here on the Slack channel. So. Uh, don't be afraid to just ask uh, what we call stupid questions because they're not stupid, okay? There are lots of things that um, our researchers have seen so many times that it's second nature to us. So um, um, that, that's why uh, uh, many of the things that are in the slides that our PhD students present to today uh, may go right over your head. And that's okay. I mean, that's the point. I mean, they have many more years of experience. Okay, but they, they boil down to pretty simple things in the end. So I, I don't think it'll be too hard for you to grasp. It's just that there's some terminology that gets in the way. Okay, um, so going forward, uh, you, you can look forward to doing a part of a presentation. So we have uh, quite a number of students in this class, um, but we, we uh, only had three presenters today. So uh, that's why it, uh, you know, we, we took a long time uh, so going ahead, what we'll be doing is likely assigning um, uh, papers uh, to uh, students. So you guys will decide which papers uh, out of the set we want you to present to look at. And like I said, it's perfectly fine if you don't know. I mean, that, that's the whole point. You can come to class and say, there's this figure that was interesting. Uh, I'm not really sure what it means. Uh, I'm not even sure what this arrow or, or, or this notation means. Um, and then uh, that, that, that's the whole point is uh, for our PhD students to have a practice uh, at uh, um, explaining where they can, okay? It is for uh, uh, our undergraduates to be more exposed to the concepts that you're presenting. And it's for you to have a chance to, to learn uh, on the fly, right? I think we all learn better when we have the pressure to actually explain it to someone else. But it's, it's not in a high stakes, uh, uh, condition, okay? It's just that we want you to try. We want you to, um, you know, explain what you understand about the paper, and then uh, you can always turn it over to uh, our, our lab members to try to explain it. Uh, and uh, for, for me too, because I'll be sitting in and uh, reading the papers on the fly while you guys are presenting, okay? So um, yeah, it, it just takes time to, to get used to it, okay? So um, to our external guests and to our uh, DYC students, uh, persevere. Don't worry. I already got some emails uh, from people saying, okay, that was really too far over my head. I want to drop. Um, and that's fine too. I can understand that. Um, but uh, do your best and uh, we'll catch up with you next week on um, through Slack first. Okay. 
And I, I hope we can start to think about what type of projects you're interested in doing. So the projects can be uh, something of your own design that uses a uh, conversation or a uh, recommendation, or it could be you know simpler than that. You can try to replicate uh, a project and then maybe uh, using that replication part, start to modify it to do something you want it to do. Okay, so that's a lot of fun. It can be a little bit painstaking as well, but that, that's uh, part of what it means to do all of this work. Okay, so uh, we thank you and we'll see you uh, next week uh, for this session then. So those of you um, in the session after this, you can um, take a five minute break and come back. Okay, that's none of us in 6101 or DYC 1401. Okay, thank you all. See you next week. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.